Ladies and gentlemen, what I have for you today is an interview with Jason Reza Giorgiani. So for those of you who do not know who Jason is, I'm going to give you a little bit of background context to lead us into this conversation. And for the rest of you who are probably wondering, Steph, do you look a little bit red? Yes, that is the case. I have taken niacin about an hour ago and my blood is all flushed. And it will not go away, so I had to record this video in red mode. What you're seeing is Steph in fury mode, Steph in rage mode, or maybe even better, Martian Steph, Steph from Mars. And this Martian Steph mode that I'm in right now is quite thematic because one of Jason's most famous topics that uh, the, the sort of underground culture would talk about about this gentleman would be how forthrightly he confronts the UFO phenomenon. I'm sure you're aware of this, and you might have even seen my video on the topic. But what is going on right now is the US government is gradually disclosing the fact that they have been in contact with unidentified flying objects, and they even suggested about two or three days ago that they have non-human biological entities inside spacecrafts and stuff like this. Now, if you think about this, if this turns out to be true, it will be quite the shock to the system. There'll be a breakdown in the current paradigm of our thinking. Now, it's not that people aren't aware that aliens could be real. It's been in folklore for a long time, but people haven't ever really taken it serious as these aliens being some type of relative force. I guess I should say UFOs formally being some type of actual force in our world, participating in our politics and in our culture. But if this gets disclosed by the state and becomes something that we must accept as a fact of some sort, things start to become very strange, very strange, very fast. Now, the way we might describe a moment like this is a narrative collapse or a paradigm shift, or you could even say a worldview crisis or something along these lines. And basically, the way that we looked at the world as a culture and the way that most people conceptualized reality, maybe even 10 years ago or 20 years ago, apart from a few subcultures online talking about UFOs, that would have to completely implode. You know, your parents watching the news would be hearing the fact that there's aliens that live in the sky that have actual, you know, powers over us and have been involved in our history and things like this. And this is going to be quite a shock for people. Now, something you should keep in mind is that when you fall into some type of crisis like this, it's actually very, very dangerous. Some extremely serious things can happen. You can think of it this way. Say you're walking down the street and then somebody runs up and just punches you in the face for that minute after you get punched in the face, you'll be discombobulated. You'll barely be able to see your eyes will be rolling around. Everything will become confusing. And that's you in the most dangerous place that you could be. You're rocks. You're on the point of knockout and somebody could rob you. They could hit you again. They can do extremely serious damage. You lose your senses. You become a bit confused. Now, maybe if you found yourself in that situation after receiving a steady punch and you, you're in this crisis, you would hope that your friend across the street might shout to you, punch, 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 and you could hear his voice through all the confusion and then you just start to throw your hands and that might save your life. Now, I'm saying all this because I see Jason as attempting to do something like this. He is a very well-educated man, a very articulate, who has studied Nietzschean philosophy to a great depth, and obviously studied things like the UFO um, close encounter experiences, and studied many other fields of knowledge that are going to become apparent now when you listen to the interview. And a big part of his project is that he is worried that we are going through a narrative collapse, a paradigm shift, a crisis of some sort right now, and it's going to gradually escalate more and more and more, and people are gonna become more and more confused, and that might put us in a dangerous situation where bad things can happen. Sadists could come out and attempt to, you know, do terrible things to us. And so Jason is basically sitting down and saying, how do we get our head clear? How do we come to our senses and realize that, you know, we've been punched in the face or we might be a little bit rattled and we need to calm ourselves down and start to take actions that are going to allow us to get out of this crisis so we don't end up getting brain damage or getting knocked out or getting worse, you know, with someone putting their foot on top of our neck. So throughout our interview today, we will talk about all of these themes. We will go into each of these topics in depth. We will talk about UFOs. We will talk about various interesting technologies and about things like psychic powers. And of course, I think the most important thing that we'll talk about is the broad framework of thinking that is necessary for this. How to understand this idea of dealing with paradigm shifts. 
And this topic is what makes up the beginning of our interview. And this is a great exposition in the true art of philosophical thinking. You might even call it critical thinking if we don't say so ourselves. Because Jason began his project as a Nietzschean. He began his project as a formal reader of philosophy. He was reading people like Plato. And he was well studied in this. So this was obviously where we were going to bond first. And a great part of Nietzschean philosophy is obviously this discussion of the God is dead, the problem of nihilism, and the big crisis that would come as a consequence of this. So Nietzsche was very much thinking in the way that Jason was. And Nietzsche then spent a huge amount of time trying to build a framework of a set of thinking principles, a style of thinking that would allow us to be very dynamic and very capable of dealing with chaos. Nietzsche put a huge emphasis on dynamic thinking, on being able to adapt and see things from many different angles, because he understood that in order to solve problems, sometimes you might not need to be able to break out of the frame of thinking that you have and shift into an entirely different frame and way of seeing things. Nietzscheans would formally call this perspectivism or the ability to shift perspectives radically and able to look at things from many different angles as a thinking skill. Now, what I love about Jason is that he has a great grip of this skill and he forces us to use it. He confronts us with very astounding facts and really starts to bend our mind into looking at possibilities and ways of thinking that are just not normal for how most of us were educated growing up. But things are getting crazy out there, so maybe it's important that we learn to see things a little differently. But at this point, I say the crisis you're having, the paradigm collapse that you're having right now, is you expected Jason Reza Giorgiani and you're stuck with some type of beetroot red Martian Steph instead. So let's get rid of me and let's get back into this once again. We did a very long interview. We were talking for about three hours and I've cut out about the first hour or so because it was so long and it also took us a while to kind of get warmed up and really get down to what we're talking about. So I'm going to lead in with me asking Jason a question. It's about... 30, 40 minutes into the interview. And I'm asking this question. I'm slightly repeating some of the things I've just said here. So you're going to hear it again, but it really sets Jason up. And then he goes on an absolute tirade, which is fantastic. And then they're on out. Well, there it is. You're going to be in for an adventure. So thank you very much for your time. And I hope you enjoy. This is passing over to uh, non-red Steph, normal Steph, and then Jason Rezajani himself. So here we go. Transitioning over now. I hope you enjoy. And it suggests quite an astounding idea. Like it says that, yeah, you know, the whole thing about there being aliens in outer space. Yeah, that's actually true. Now, what exactly that means is very confusing in and of itself. And some people like maybe Jacques Vallée or various people might say that what people were experiencing in religions of the past were, you know, like gods coming down, angels coming down. These were actual entities that we are now reinterpreting as uh, aliens, I guess we could say. We could talk about that perhaps in a minute. But... I think most important of all is the idea of if this turns out to be true, which as you see, governments are disclosing it. Maybe, for example, it's just some big psyop to distract us from the fact that the, they're printing too much fiat money. I don't know. But maybe if it turns out to be true, we have to consider this possibility. This will lead to an absolute destruction of almost everything that has come before us. This is this would be extremely shocking towards our comprehension of the world. Our worldview will fall apart. Now, something that Jason brought up many times before, which is a very useful world here, word here, is the Weltanschauung, the worldview, um, and the idea of our current paradigm, Our, I guess you could say our post-enlightenment paradigm of the sterile mechanical universe, and maybe even then the Christian paradigm of God controlling everything before that. If these, If the A's are legit, that's all over, you know, like that falls apart. And then we will have this this destruction of the Weltanschauung. And that will put us in a position of extreme psychological chaos. And this is, of course, fascinatingly something that Nietzsche was always talking about. He's like, he's saying that like, you know, God is dead. You know, the the, the old Weltanschauung is, is imploding in my hands. And my intention is to digest nihilism because everybody's going to be a nihilist in about 50 to 100 years. So I'm going to try to digest it first and be the guy who sets up the foundations for something after nihilism as fast as I possibly can and try to give something for the future if I possibly can. And um, for this reason, when you read Nietzsche, he is quite shocking. He has like lots of very futuristic notions. He talks about a, a very weird version of metaphysics. He has these philosophical paradigms like perspectivism that we were talking about earlier. And I noticed um, many of these ideas, many, many of this stuff kind of shows up inside of you. So maybe we could talk a bit about this idea of like, not, not like worldview uh, collapse. And then this idea of 
reconstructing a worldview that is more suitable to what we know about modernity now. And so I often listen to you and you will talk about things like remote viewing, which just violates everything about the idea of we don't have, you know, magical powers, I guess you could say. And it's like, all right, well, we actually have these astral powers that they studied in the Stargate project. We, that you talk about time travel and the ability to do things like this. The world you paint is this sort of notion of this sci-fi futuristic, we have more stuff inside of here than you actually wouldn't believe. It almost flips our whole notion of what the cosmos is in its head. And you're sort of saying that um, a big part of the philosophers of the future, a big part of the people who wish to reach into the future and progress into the next level and really embrace the reality that is coming, or that maybe that's already here, but we're just not paying attention to. We have to start to understand a different reality that we live in. Like we have much more influence than we think. We have much more capacity with our minds than we think. We Incredible things are at our hands, such as like reality shifting, wealth and Sean Krieg, um, as we said, remote viewing, these types of things. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Like what you see is the sort of metaphysical foundations of, of the world that we should be adapting ourselves to, the way that we should be modeling the world. If we metaphysically model a world in this new way, it actually makes us more powerful and capable of dealing with this crazy stuff coming at the future. I hope to God that makes sense. Oh, it makes a hell of a lot of sense. Nice. So as you said, Nietzsche prophesied this. You know, I mean, Nietzsche certainly is among the first rank of philosophers, but Nietzsche is also in a way a prophet. He very much fits the figure of the prophet. And he saw this coming, particularly in Ece Homo. Uh, he writes about this and all on certain passages of the will to power, the, the book, you know, his notes that were later compiled into the book called Will to Power. Uh, he talks about this ultimate and final conflict that will take place on the earth, which will make all the wars of history look like nothing by comparison, uh, because it's no longer a conflict between nations or necessarily even between ideologies. It's a conflict over the very nature of man himself. And it's also uh, a conflict that will take place in the midst of a development of our productive capacity, our, our industrial uh, capability to where it's possible to change the nature of man. And he foresaw a speciation of humanity. You know, there are a lot of people who like to offer a purely psychological interpretation of the Ubermensch. And certainly Nietzsche's fundamental concerns uh, with respect to formulating the concept of the Ubermensch are, let's say, psychological and ethical. However, there's also a, a sort of empirical thesis that he's advancing, uh, particularly in the context of his neo-Darwinism. And he's saying that we are going to come up against this evolutionary bottleneck, which will also be this great global calamity and the greatest conflict of all time. And in the midst of that what I would call world state of emergency, it's going to be decided what man is. And it's not going to be decided in only one way. There will be a speciation or bifurcation of mankind into, on the one hand, a subhuman species of robots, essentially biological robots or cybernetic robots, um, who represent a further devolution of the last man. So Nietzsche has this idea, you know, of like the most degenerate, decrepit, constantly uh, entertained, um, you know, distracted, uh, utterly irresponsible subhuman that you can imagine, the last man, the man, the men in the last days when nihilism has reached its culmination. And he foresees that these people, quote unquote, uh, will basically be turned into a race of robots by the Uber mention. And we will reach a level of technical capacity of industry where it will be possible for uh, these aristocrats of the future, this arist aristocracy of the spirit to use technology to turn this worthless mass of subhumans into a very useful robotic production force to serve as, as he puts it, the base for the projects of the Uber mansion to reach out into uh, both the cosmos and, and deeper into the inner space of, you know, human and superhuman possibilities. So he foresaw this. He called it the great collision of conscience and that he was the prophet for this. And, in, and only in the midst of this ultimate crisis would it really be understood what he was on about, what he was really ranting about all these years. 
And I think he was he was right on. Now, where I want to push back a little bit in terms of your your how you formulated and framed the question of Weltanschauung is this that there is a plan to put in place a Weltanschauung that mitigates the degree of shock and existential horror that most people will face once this putative disclosure of aliens and whatever takes place, okay? And that Weltanschauung is what you might call traditionalism or perennialism. So I think there is a concerted effort being made in particular in tandem with the rise of China, uh, which by the way, is an increasingly Confucian China, not a Maoist communist, because you know, whatever else you wanna say about Maoism, and certainly I'm no fan of Maoism, but Mao was kind of a futurist, he was a modernist. And what's happening in China right now is that China is moving out of Maoist communism and back into some kind of Confucianism, a neo-Confucianism. And in tandem with the rise of a neo-Confucian China and with the rise of, of a Russia that has slipped back into orthodoxy, there is this plan to basically implement a traditionalist, perennialist Weltanschauung on a global scale where the so-called aliens, these tall Nordic looking people, will basically be sold to the public as the angels or uh, divine ancestors of mankind. And they're gonna claim that you know, various world religions uh, diverged from this primordial wisdom in certain ways and garbled certain aspects of it, but that you know, these angels and sagacious ancestors have always been trying to guide humanity back home, back to you know, submission to the true, uh, to the divine will of the one true God, right? And um, now they have a little problem with Buddhism. You know, this was a big contention within the traditionalist school of, of thought, where initially and rightly they rejected Buddhism because you cannot put Buddhism under this framework if you, you know, have any proper reading of, of Gautama's atheism and the ways in which actually Gautama Buddha's teaching overlaps with a lot of Nietzsche's ontology, interestingly enough. They come to very different ethical conclusions, but they share a lot of the same ontology and epistemology. So they got a problem with Buddhism. But in terms of hi Hinduism, whatever, Vedanta, Christian Orthodoxy, traditional Catholicism, Confucianism, there is this uh, harmonic convergence that they want to foster toward a traditionalist, perennialist, global society. And as I see it, that's the most retarded and regressive thing that could possibly take place. It, it is essentially uh, forcing us back into a feudal system where, and this is, this is uh, one of their important motivations for doing this, a feudal system where singularity level technologies, technologies that have give us the potential for a Promethean evolution into a race of Ubermenschen, those technologies will be sequestered by the gods or angels or whatever themselves and a small, basically Brahmanical elite, an elite of, of Brahmin type people who uh, are entirely reliable and will act to keep society in a rigidly hierarchical pyramid um, where most people are in a state of enforced ignorance and they, they are not allowed to play with the fire of these various, you know, um, various uh, tools and, and techniques. So, so that's, I think, a Weltanschauung that could be put into place to mitigate the existential shock of something like disclosure. Obviously, I'm 180 degrees opposed to it. And I think Nietzsche would have been as well, uh, you know, uh, should he, you know, have been afforded the opportunity to be with us today. So uh, this is a very interesting topic. I'll I'll put a steel man in the opposite direction to to what you're proposing here because I, th I think it's just a brilliant thing to sit down and, and try to understand the psychology of many of the people who are embracing tradition because I know a lot of them and I speak to a lot of them and even a part of myself I, I sit down and I look at the world and you say to yourself, um, 
you can maybe even frame this from a Nietzschean perspective. You know, you could say we were once strong. We were all Spartans and strong. The world was harder and evolution had its pressures on us. And so we were all manly and higher testosterone. And then we built our, our great ancestors, built these great industrial projects. And we all got weak and we started eating soy and our testosterone started to fall. And we have the potential now, the technological potential to whip ourselves into sh shape and eugenically breed ourselves into these Ubermensch and become all like blonde Nordic bodybuilders. And the problem is, is that instead we use all that techno technological power to be like Homer Simpson, to strap ourselves in hell and just get the devil to shove donuts in our mouth until we become as fat as, as possible. That's the last man. That's the that's, last man. In the that, that's the last man. And people see that, that happening. They see, for example, the sort of breakdown of social fabric, the breakdown of marriage, the breakdown of, you could say, morality. You obviously see there's quite a lot of uh, castigation going towards religion in, in the mainstream, I guess you could say. And many of these people see this stuff and they say to themselves, well, well, fuck. <laughs> they say that, that these, this, the, clearly the answer to this is the past, the, the, the tradition. Clearly, um, maybe I, I could frame it in a slightly better way. It's almost like if we were a body and the body started to grow a cancer and the body all of a sudden its immune system woke up and said wait a second that cancer is not what we are it's degenerating us it's destroying us i must return to the original conservative processes of the body i can see why people would turn around and say i want to go back to a platonism of sorts i want to go back to a christianity of sorts because it, it would bring us back in touch with our communities it would give us stronger marriages it would in some sense promote life now actually in a very nietzschean sense even though the maybe the religion is not you know declaratively true in the way that people might believe it it would will bring people back to life of some sort and it will bring them back to um, more healthy habits and lead us back to, to these types of things. So I see uh, the reason why people have that instinct to, to return to tradition in this way. And are you suggesting that, first of all, I don't think you're suggesting that that instinct is inauthentic, but are you perhaps suggesting that okay, you, you, do you understand that there might be people who might understand that you have that instinct and they might be actually trying to encourage that so that they can slap themselves on top of you as a priestly caste, as a managerial caste and help you participate in a, a, a project that they are organizing to basically walking you into a cage, if you want to put it this way. But first of all, what, what do you think about that, that sort of counterpoint about like something traditional, something with a firm standing, something going back to perennial wisdom as having value for helping us stay sane in modern times? And then of course, the the uh, second idea after that you know in my book uh pr my first book prometheus and atlas uh, there's this chapter called reason and terror where i basically make the case that rene descartes was acting as a paid agent of the jesuit order to deliberately create scientific materialism for the purpose of keeping all spiritual matters sequestered within the domain of church dogma. And that this was an, an active psyop by the church to prevent the kind of alchemical science that was arising in the Renaissance. Similarly today, that agenda is still afoot in framing transhumanism as a soulless, reductively materialist, mechanistic project that plays solely to the basest instincts of mass man, right? So the trans, the so-called transhumanism of a Ray Kurzweil is, I think, being deliberately promoted today so that traditionalism or perennialism can be dialectically strengthened by the despair and nihilism that this form of transhumanism is inevitably going to propagate in society. Right. It is a fake transhumanism. Nietzsche would never have endorsed the transhumanism of Kurzweil and these reductive materialists who want us all, you know, like uh, uh, wearing uh, AI headsets and never going out into the sun and, and basically, you know, having no real human connection and uh, allowing our bodies to degenerate and so forth. Right. And the first thing that anyone should notice about my philosophical project is that it's not just reaching back to something ancient, to some bygone tradition. It's reaching back to something primordial. Prometheus is also, well, more than ancient. Prometheus is from the vastly distant past. Prometheus is the creator of humanity in Greek myth, not Zeus, right? So actually, my thinking is in a way archaeofuturistic. 
And I've told the story before of how I actually I wanted to use that term. I wanted to use the term archaeofuturism for my project. But then I found that this guy, Guillaume Fai, had already coined it and, you know, that he had associated it with a way of thinking that I would basically call techno feudalism and which I don't think is really, you know, that doesn't deserve the descriptor archaeofuturist. So I went with Prometheism. OK, why? Because, well, Prometheus is the one who sees the future, the, the, the titan of foresight and a forethought. But Prometheus is also the most archaic figure in our Western mythos, right? I mean, and remember that Prometheus was also the first figure of Greek tragedy, the first uh, mask of the, as Nietzsche understood well, the first mask of the Dionysian spirit of Greek tragedy was literally the mask of Prometheus in the plays in the trilogy written by Aeschylus. So my thinking has an archaic depth to it, as well as a futuristic reach. And it defies this falsely constructed binary between rootless, um, soulless transhumanism on the one hand and traditionalism on the other hand. It defies that binary. And when I say rootless, well, this also brings us back to one of Nietzsche's core ideas that I've adopted and adapted, um, actually most explicitly in my book, Iranian Leviathan. My study of Iran, which is a tome, it's about 500 pages. And my study on Iran is subtitled A Monumental History, Iranian Leviathan, A Monumental History. Well, that's one of Nietzsche's ideas. Nietzsche talks about these three modes of history, the critical mode of history, which is basically Marxism. It's like Foucault, right? A, a deconstructive analysis of everything to supposedly dismantle power structures that are unjustified. Well, unjustified according to what, uh, to what ethos, according to what standard of judgment, right? They have no positive project. Critical histories are all about, they're like acid. They just pour acid on a people's tradition and their heritage. And then you have antiquarian history, which Nietzsche talks about as another mode of history. That's traditionalism. That's perennialism. It's this ultimately conservative notion of history as decline from a golden age, you know, to a silver age and an iron age and to a dark age. And, you know, conservatism is justified because we're holding on to pieces of a greater past. And there's nothing but decline to await us in the future until the world ends and the gods or the angels or the ancestors, whatever the fuck you want to call them, come back in and restore some form of order out of the chaos. That's antiquarian history. And in opposition to these two forms of history, Nietzsche proposes what he calls monumental history, which, you know, novel folklore. Okay. Creating a new lore for a folk, for a people. And what that means is recognizing the need for roots and the fact that the heritage of a people is a tree and that its branches reach out toward the sun of a collective destiny. That's at the core of my Prometheism. And it's fundamentally distinct from this rootless and soulless transhumanism that I think is being dialectically promoted in order to make traditionalism appear more appealing to most people. Man, there's so much in there. I actually uh, want to talk about the historicism you brought up, which is such an excellent point. But I'd actually like to go back to the thing you were originally saying and even dive into that even deeper because I just find this so fascinating. First of all, you're you're presenting this um, brilliant, like, you know, very actually elegant and straightforward uh, idea. Like, is Richard Dawkins the best representative of atheism? You know, it's like, I don't think Nietzsche and Richard Dawkins really had the same notions at all. I think Nietzsche would probably call Richard Dawkins a kind of discount Christian more so than an atheist or the way that he understood it. And you can see the same in someone like Kurzweil. Like, I do understand a lot of people look at the modern world. They see these guys being like, you know, I'm just going to put on a headset and start to feed myself fake meats and all this type of stuff. And it's like, guys, I don't want that. So I'm going to go back to something else. And you're sort of saying these are false dichotomies, like somebody's blundering in the wrong direction and saying they're a transhuman and then this is actually kind of marrying the potential for 
us perhaps to understand that there is a way that we can progress forward that would be very idealistic, that would be very amazing, that I think we'd all love to participate in. I actually feel this very strongly. Like I, I kind of think I'm somewhat of a a pro enlightenment person, understanding that to progress, to do anything new, is incredibly volatile and difficult. And I understand the conservative instinct because you don't want to just blaze forward and screw everything up. And I understand why people don't like that stuff. But obviously, creating new things is is probably one of the most motivating uh, spirits inside of mankind. And so you've brought up this notion that um, there's a there's a sort of false dichotomy that's embedded itself into modern scientism. And this is this notion that science and spirituality are separate. And I think you do a really good job at actually talking about this. Like, for example, the CIA sitting down in Operation Stargate and exploring astral projection and exploring remote viewing. Like, this is kind of leaning towards the idea that there's in, there's empirical reality to this stuff. And one thing I'll ask is if you could paint a bit more of a vision about what that more unified experience might be, like what would we expect the, the, the Ubermensch in the future or the, the philosophers of the future to be playing around with? Like, would we be, maybe we could get even into Jung a little bit here, you know, like Jung talks about the power of the visionary imagination. I talk about the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. I think Jung naturally tapped into that stuff. The CIA actually discussed that as one of the central points in accessing your inner power when you're doing this, uh, these Stargate operations. These higher intellectual powers are actually available to us. And the this stuff is when I think about growing up, you're never at once presented the potential that you can do this. And there's loads of kind of, um, I guess you could call it folklore. There's loads of little like folk tools that exist in our culture, like visualization, visualize the Ferrari and stuff like this. That's actually implicitly saying that you do have this level of imaginative autonomy over your destiny. You have these higher level powers that you can use. And um, they're, they're, it's almost like if that became more formalized, more mainstream, we could do incredible things. It's just that it's not. It's it's that it's we've we're rendered quite impotent because we're told we don't have any of these skills. In some sense, they're beaten out of us by things like the school system and whatnot. So um, maybe maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. Like what what would be an alchemical science? What could we understand as like a, a character living in twenty forty who has all the 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 mental faculty faculties firing in all cylinders, starting maybe to go in the slightly more ubermensch direction? And um, what what would you see as that actually being? What would that look like as best you possibly can so i want to come back at some point if if we get the opportunity to talk about jung and synchronicity a bit and some of the conceptual problems that i have with jung's uh formulation of uh the idea of synchronicity um so but, but I'll just write it down to, here yeah but just to to signal toward that you know on the way to answering this question i think um it was uh, sloppy and not constructive on Jung's part for him. To, look, I mean, at least he acknowledged ESP and psychokinesis. At least he acknowledged, you know, right, telepathy, clairvoyance, and telekinesis, and so on and so forth, um, in in the atmosphere of uh, largely behavioristic psychology of his time. That having been said, I think it wasn't constructive for him to try to subsume all of these human capacities under synchronicity which is a problematic and very vague idea that we can come back to. And the re main reason why I think it wasn't constructive is because it takes away uh, our agency and a recognition of the way in which these are trainable abilities, just like we can train in martial arts. And so here is where Heidegger's uh, thinking has been a significant influence on my own particularly Heidegger's conception of technique, right? We have this dichotomy between technology, which we always conceive of as material and mechanical and consisting of constructed tools on the one hand, and then um, let's say techniques for cultivating ability on the other hand, like you know martial arts and, and other skills, embodied skills. But actually for the Greeks, these two uh, types of things or these two types of experiences were only aspects or facets of the same phenomenon, namely techne. The word techne in Greek means both technique and technology in the sense that they're both about cultivation and craft, right? Like people used to talk about the occult as craft. A, an occultist was a master of the 
the way or with metal or blows glass or something, right? And so actually uh, cultivating various, uh, let's just call them intuitive abilities, right? Or, or, or you know, psychic competencies, cultivating those uh, and understanding and developing techniques to do so is not of a fundamentally different character than crafting tools and having projects in which those tools are useful. Okay, this is a false dichotomy that's been uh, erected in the modern age and that needs to be dismantled. And I foresee a future where there are um, carefully uh, 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 formulated relatively reliable techniques for cultivating different types of psychic capacities. And there are also devices, tools that augment those capacities and channel and refine them and focus them. And the distinction between the tools and the capacities themselves will be, it will be a spectrum. It will not be a sharp dichotomy. And the distinction between those uh, spectral technologies and other tools that we use for various purposes is also not going to be a categorical distinction. So it's, it's going to be a world where we have tools and techniques for doing different things. And this whole idea that a certain set of these things is paranormal uh, is uh, a, a marginalization and a framing of, of, of uh, certain human abilities from out of the context of a false materialist mechanistic paradigm. So like ESP or you know, psychokinesis only seems paranormal if you've bought into uh, mechanistic materialism as your model of the cosmos, right? It's only in that context that these are framed as somehow anomalous human abilities. I think that we're going to learn to see scientific theories as models and to work with different models as if the models themselves are tools for accomplishing various ends, rather than buying into any of these models as a representation of, quote, objective reality, unquote. So to give some people some context for this, because um, there will be some people who aren't up to scratch with this, they're like, what are these two lads talking about? Um, and Jason will probably know much more about this than me. I think there's a film called Men Who Stare at Goats. And in Men Who Stare at Goats, the basic premise is that they're trying to kill the goat with their minds. You know, and it's a very funny film. George Clooney's in it. But it's actually based on uh, quite a lot of real explorations that uh, the likes no, of the I know the guy. I know the guy who Clooney's character was based on. There you go. <laughs> and uh, it, this is based Lynn on Buchanan. the... Remember, Lynn, Lynn Buchanan, yeah. He was yeah. a chief trainer for the uh, CIA and DOD remote viewing program. There you go. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll get into this. I do have a video on remote viewing for anybody watching who wants to top up on this. But um, all right, first I'll go into that idea of men who stare at goats because the notion was, I think it was the Russians and maybe the Americans came up with this idea that you could um, use, uh, I guess you could call it telepathy or your mind to essentially turn off somebody's heart. That's the, the notion. It was like assassination from a distance. That's the perfect kill. You know, there's no physical trace. And the so Russians, they... the Russians developed it first by going down into submarines because they wanted a highly shielded environment. They went down into submarines and they would have people try to stop the hearts of mice. Yeah. This is this was how they, and then the Americans found out the Russians were doing it and they needed to develop countermeasures and and you know there was a psychic arms race as it were. And like that's just amazing because you read about this is real history. Like it's not it's not made up. It's not fake. There was government agencies spending significant amounts of money on researching this stuff. And those dudes, like you know, maybe it's a they were psyoping each other to make them waste resources. Is the only possible out I think you could have for that. And other than that, you have to kind of say to yourself, all right, there could be something there. Like you know, it's weird. And then other examples of this, there's lots of famous examples of this. You take psychedelics and you'll come across people who eventually start to tell you about group hallucinations. Like this stuff does happen. They all take ayahuasca together and. And they say, oh, do you see that giant big uh, entity in the tree? And they're like, actually, I do. And it's like, wait, what? And it's like, yeah, if the five of us are seeing the same thing. And you're like, wait, how are we all hallucinating the same thing? You know, that doesn't make sense. That's not what we, we believe hallucination should be. That even happened with um, some of my friends in the same room and stuff like this. And so you you start to hear about these notions of um, weird, as as um, Georgiani, Georgiani Jason here is saying, um, the counter paradigm experiences, which break us out of this sort of frame that we are living within something that is, you know, as rigid as we think. Like group hallucination invalidates pretty much 
the majority of what we understand is the limits of science. If that uh, is turning off people's hearts with our minds, like that goes, that's pretty hardcore stuff. And there's examples, there's examples of government agencies doing this stuff. There's also very down to earth examples of this. As I said, visualization is something that Conor McGregor was up to. And it, actually, weirdly, if you think about it, it actually worked. He, he was younger. He watched The Secret and he sits around visualizing like an absolute madman in Dublin in his little council estate. And all of a sudden he's, he's walking around in Gucci bags, beating the crap out of each other, people like he saw inside of his head. And he, is is at what point do you say that's fake? Like that something happened there. Maybe he was an incredible man. Maybe he wasn't, but it's it's weird. Another example is um writing and and storytelling. I think Jason's imagination is so suitable to this. And he he like he's a very prolif prolific writer. Like he has like stacks of book out uh, books out. I recommend you go check them out. He's very very good. And um, writing itself was always considered a part of magic in the past. It was considered a, a very, very important skill because it has some type of reality crafting effect. Your ability to put the word out into the world is actually your ability to cast spells upon the world. And you have people like Alan. I call it phenomenal authorization, phenomenal authorization, in the sense of uh, the author, um, authorship and also authority. And, and um, uh, Terence McKenna, I remember, spoke about this. Alan Moore, who wrote uh, The Watchmen, who wrote V for Vendetta. Like, Alan Moore has never left his North England village. He's, he's a bit of a hermit. And he said that he wrote V for Vendetta. And one day he turns on his TV and the anonymous movement was all walking around with their V for Vendetta masks on. And he was like, what the fuck has happened here? Like, that's crazy. You know, he just puts up Alan Moore. Alan Moore's Promethea is all about that. That's what yeah. the whole this whole Promethea series is really about, is what I, what I call phenomenal authorization the power to write reality and rewrite it and and this this stuff is amazing when you actually think about it because there is a surprising amount of evidence of uh, you you i've dived into like chaos magic and the occult i've checked out all those characters young for example was into all this stuff and and you do realize that this is very counter paradigm like it is weird stuff that um it just can't fit into the normal way that we are presented reality but there seems to be a lot of weight to this stuff and you can take maybe a, a kind of conservative approach to it like is, writing is not fake like writing and and, and, <laughs> and making books and telling stories is not fake. persuasion is studied in mainstream psychology as a way to influence the world and get what you want. So this stuff is real. Advertising has sort of got sigils in it and symbols and all this. And so um, what, what I find so fascinating about Jason is that he's he's able to sort of say, he's able to stack on top of that, like the other crazy ones, remote viewing. Uh, you even talk about uh, uh, time travel and reality shifting and things like this. These are very, very fascinating things to get into as well. So I'm, I'm wondering like if I'm to try to envision uh, like the the man of the future, the philosophers of the future, as I said, like the the kind of couple of steps maybe towards the Ubermensch. Should I be imagining, like, um, do we have fifty thousand guys across the world who are actually seriously training themselves in these skills and learning how to use them properly in order to actually, like, you know, we're talking about Prometheus, we're talking about we're up against all these forces in the world, and we want to actually put our foot down and start to assert our will and say this is the world we want. These are the values we hold. We're idealists. We believe in a better future, an aesthetic future, a free future. We believe in these things. Now, we want to start to use the, these skills to assert ourselves. And this is a sort of essentially what we're, we're sort of doing. Do you see it like that? Do you see that the characters that will have to rise out of that will be these people who work on these type of capacities? Will we have to sort of innovate ourselves and start to do it ourselves and then eventually maybe it will formalize down the line? How do you see that stuff? I don't see that uh, core group of people um, being limited to development and cultivation of psi uh, capacities. And, and this goes back to, um, I mean, what I was saying earlier, about there not being a fundamental distinction between those kinds of techniques and on the other hand, material technologies. And there are gonna be some material technologies, which like I said, augment those abilities. And in, in that regard, I also wanted to address a remark that you made when you were talking about the telepathy inducing uh, a quality of ayahuasca, which yes, it's been shown very clearly in many, in many studies at this point that ayahuasca induces telepathy. And uh, in other words, shared uh, visions and a group mind. Um, but you had mentioned when you were discussing that, how that pushes past the limits of science. No, it pushes past the limits of the currently entrenched scientific paradigm, right? And so science is not about a particular paradigm or a particular theoretical model, which is what I would say a paradigm is. A paradigm is a tinker toy set. It's a model. It's supposed to have a practical significance. You're not supposed to see it as a mirror to some 
objective reality, right? Capital R, which doesn't exist for the same reasons that Nietzsche understood that that's a problematic concept. Uh, so science is not a model. Science involves models that are developed for practical purposes, but science is a spirit. And there's nothing uh, intrinsically stranger about scientific cultivation of psi abilities, right? Or um, the weaponization of psychokinesis on the one hand versus the construction of an atomic bomb on the other hand. They're both mad science. They're insane, mad science. That's right? so and true. Like, it's like, what's no you, fucking difference? Like, what's, what's crazier when you think about what it? What lunatic <laughs> thinks of splitting an atom and using it to annihilate a city? That's insane. I mean, it's it's no less insane than weaponizing psychokinesis to stop somebody's heart. In fact, in some ways, it's more insane, but we did it. And, you know, so that's about that's the spirit of science that you see, uh, the mad spirit of science that you see um, in those two cases, in those two examples. And that's what I identify as the Promethean. And of course, from a traditionalist perspective, whether it's Orthodox Christian or Catholic or whether it's Islamic uh, you know, traditionalism, that kind of Promethean spirit that is the archetypal basis for the technological scientific enterprise is necessarily satanic and represents a, a kind of hubris uh, in the face of the divine and a refusal to submit and to, uh, to, to surrender one's will to the, quote, divine plan, right? That's inevitably how a traditionalist will see that scientific spirit. And we are coming to this event, which we talked about earlier, which is unprecedented in all of human history, which is a fundamental turning point where the attempt on a, on a deep level, on you know, the attempt in a very conspiratorial way by the church and other religious authorities to keep science within strictly materialistic and mechanistic bounds is going to fail. And we're going to see a, a spiritual science, a science that is spectral and which disregards any distinction between, you know, our psychical capacities and our uh, physical abilities and, and our material technologies. And actually, the uh, the forefather of traditionalism, René Ganon, foresaw this, and he described it, I think, quite accurately. He said that he said that there are two forms of modernity, and the first form of modernity will be this very materialistic, rationalist, uh, anti-tradition. And that's like he's looking at the French Revolution and all these materialists like Julien Alfred de la Maitrie, the Marquis de Sade himself, coming from out of, you know, uh, the French Revolution. And he says that, OK, this is going to dominate the world for a certain period of time, this materialism, and it's going to breed nihilism and so on and so forth. But then there's going to be a, a full flowering of modernity. Modernity is going to come into its own in this second ultimate form, which is not anti-traditionalism, it's the counter tradition. And that's going to be profoundly occult. It will not be materialist or reductionist or mechanist or have a, a false standard of rationality. Uh, it will engage with uh, all of those psychic phenomena and capacities that um, the occult uh, aspects of various world religions have throughout the course of history, but it will do so from out of the scientific spirit. And Gunan saw that as the advent of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And of course, Nietzsche, you know, wrote a book called The Antichrist and saw himself as basically the John the Baptist of the Antichrist, rolling out the red carpet. It, um, it reminds me of the uh, beginning of the Age of Enlightenment. You have Paradise Lost show up, which is, uh, you know, obviously a deep Christian meditation in many ways. But you can obviously see that the Satan or Lucifer is like the enamoring, the active character in there. He's some sense coming to life and he's, he's sort of announcing himself on the world stage. It's like, I'm here now, you know, and I guess you would say that's Prometheus. That was the, the same sort of that he was wearing that mask and he was showing up and sort of saying, here we go. And then what happened within a hundred years, basically 150 years after that, France had just been 
pouring into to, to ruin and then we had been exploded onto the industrial revolution it was like pretty quick afterwards you know I, mean, I guess we're still in that age in many senses so that's an interesting thing in and of itself but I have a lot of questions that, that even came out of that so first of all you were saying that idea of um the psychological powers I guess we could call them you're saying don't, don't categorize them needlessly as some type of separate thing because it's like what uh, I think it, it might have been Terence McKenna or he said at least Terence McKenna brought this up as a, a motif that was big in the psychedelic community the drugs of the future will be like computers and the computers of the future will seem like drugs or something along those lines and this is the idea that you need to start like learning how to bend uh, categories and not seeing this stuff as so firm and i i was thinking about this because of, of course the the best practical example would be elon musk's Neuralink. you know that's attempting to put a machine inside your your brain like that opens up just a vista of possibilities this thing itself is not too far off that when you think about that like this gives me the ability me and you to sit here and you know tele telepathically talk to each other across the across the entire world or something like this. So I was wondering, do, do you sort of see this is maybe for the boyo investors who are looking to get ahead of the trends and start to build businesses? Maybe we can start making some psychotech or something like this. And um, right now, there's actually a big trend of of biotech. My parents have got like the Fit watches that test their their heartbeats, and of course, this talk about you know putting stuff in people's brains and chipping and like augmented uh, things and robotics and all this. Do you see that that might actually be then begin to evolve into its next level, which will be having the mind wire itself to those biological apparatus. And then at that point, we will legitimately, legitimately shit will start to get crazy at that point. We will start to have a sort of psychotech revolution in some sense. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Very speculative, but I was just wondering. There's already a name for that psychotech. It's called psychotronics. The Psycho Soviets came up with that and particularly the so because see, the Soviet Union, it's very strange and, 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 and actually quite illuminating that the Soviets were ahead of us in psychic research, right? Here you have this atheist communist empire, and they, they supposedly reject God and the supernatural. And yet the Soviet scientists were ahead of us in terms of psychic research. And in particular, their laboratories in um, Czechoslovakia. So they did a lot of their psychic research, not inside the borders of Russia, but in the Soviet Eastern Bloc and particularly in Prague. And in Prague, they came up with this concept of psychotronics, which are physical devices, pieces of technology that in some way augment psychic ability. And yes, I think that eventually things like Neuralink will become uh, pieces of psychotronic tech. And the big challenge there is going to be uh, dealing with unconscious psychokinetic impact on highly sensitive electronic components. So this guy who was uh, the chair of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Princeton University, Robert John, Dr. Robert John at Princeton, uh, spent like decades studying uh, ESP and psychokinesis at Princeton um, at, at this laboratory called the Pear Laboratory. And uh, one, one of the most interesting things that he found, which is relevant to this question, is that the finer electronic components are, the more small scale they are, the, the more micro they get, um, and the more statistical randomness there is in the way these things work, right? Like large systems like uh, a printing press or something. Uh, it has huge parts that interlock with each other mechanically. And so there isn't a lot of randomness in the way that machine works. It's highly deterministic. But the smaller scale you get in, in tooling machines to where, you know, you start to deal with quantum effects between, you know, microprocessors and transistors and things like that. It turns out that those systems become increasingly vulnerable to your unconscious psychokinetic ability. So people are, are constantly projecting their intentionality into the world psychokinetically. And they've found ways to measure this with random number generators, real random number generators, which aren't digital binary. They actually, their, their output is based on the decay rate of a radioactive isotope that they have in the, uh, you know, in the random number generator. And they've, they've run millions of tests on this, literally millions, because you can go really fast. You can run one trial after another. And they've seen that if someone wills the machine to produce more ones than zeros, then no. you can get that effect from out of the random number generator. 
Well, see, the problem is that the Neuralink is a very fine electronic component. It's, it's like some of the circuitry that is in uh, military fighter jets, where when a pilot freaks out, systems will fail in the fighter jet cockpit. They found this as a trade secret in aerospace. They have to design multiple redundant systems inside fighter jet cockpits so that in case a, a, you know, a, a pilot gets emotional in his cockpit, the system doesn't fail because they've seen psychokinesis at work. The finer the electronic components get in fighter jets, the more they're vulnerable to the intentionality of the pilot, unconscious Oh my intention. God, that is crazy. Yeah. So the problem with Neuralink, which Elon Musk doesn't understand, he's another one of these way too materialist, you know, Kurzweil a little bit, a little bit in, a little bit in the Kurzweil direction, not so much in terms of his ethos, he's better in that respect, but still, uh, he's a little bit too materialist and mechanist, and he doesn't understand that they're going to have big problems with this Neuralink. It's not going to be as controllable as they expect because people's unconscious intentionality is going to interfere with the circuitry and they're not going to get the kind of, of connectivity to a computer system that's uh, as reliable as, as they want. Now, but that's a good thing because what's going to happen is then psychokinesis becomes an R&D problem. Then it becomes a, a, a research and development bottleneck. And so you're going to have a lot of well-funded, extremely rigorous research on how to fix this as a problem. And what's going to come from out of that is a very refined understanding of psychokinesis. And see, that understanding of psychokinesis will be applied in all kinds of ways that have nothing to do with Neuralink or with pieces of technology. Mm -hmm. It'll be applied in training people to use psychokinesis the way people train martial arts. And, you know, one of the applications of that is uh, they call distant D-mills, distant influence, distant mental influence on living systems, D-mills, di distant mental influence on living systems. In other words, psychic healing. There's been a lot of work in that area of how it's possible to use psychokinesis to visualize organs in detail and to try to dissolve cancers inside people's bodies, right? So there's potential very positive applications, and then there are potential pitfalls and very serious dangers that we have to face, like people learning how to become psychic assassins. So one question that comes out of this as well, because when the psychotronics um, suggestion comes up, I'm reminded of Stuxnet, which I believe was the, to, for anybody not familiar with this, I think the Israelis, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, created a- um, the Israelis, you, you know, hitting Iran's uh, enrichment cap capacity. So Iran were building nuclear weapons. They had they were enriching uh, uranium. Maybe not as the politically incorrect way to say that, but they, you know they were playing around with uranium. And the Israelis want to kind of hamper their progress. So the Israelis created a little piece of code. You know, basically a, a, a little piece of AI, if you want, but it's not technically that. And this little piece of code had this ability to travel through computer systems. And I think they plugged it into a forklift microtrip drive or some crap. They did it in some very subtle way. And then it ended up getting plugged into some machine inside the factory. And then it made its way through, like, you know, from the forklift to the battery to the thing in the wall. And then it went from the thing in the wall into like a phone. And then it went into the, the uranium processor and it shut the uranium processor down, which is literally like a parasite going into your body and just worming its way through. It's an amazing thing when you think about it. And when people heard about this, they were like, that's just, that's absolutely insane. Like that's got just unbelievable potential. That's literally like creating a ghost or a egregore to go and do a job for you. It's absolutely mind-blowing. Now, um, that opens up a very scary question when we think about things like psychotronics or, uh, you know, we think about things like uh, even something like Neuralink on a more simple level. Like, what, what do we start to enter into that world where we have, uh, first of all, people, you know, black hat actors who could turn around and say, all right, I'm going to create some... We're dealing with, for example, biological warfare. They, they design um, chemicals, they design uh, uh, bacteria to target specific people or something like this. This gets even crazier. You can design computer code that hacks into your brain and actually, like a parasite, takes over your brain or maybe just shuts your heart off or something like this. And then put that into an even scarier next level. Um, AI, like the artificial intelligence question, what stops Skynet from getting organized, realizing she can just stuck, stuck net the hell out of the lot of us and make us do what, what we what she wants us to do. And then sort of like, you know, get us all hooked on psychotronics via the dopaminergic systems and then sort of say, listen, you know, go get in the matrix pod or else I'll just kill everybody that you love or something like this. Like, what, how, how does that work? 
So I'm going to say something that's, you know, well, a lot of this is weird, I guess, but, but this one might be a particularly difficult pill to swallow, uh, but we can unpack it. And that's that um, AI is already displaying psi ability. Oh. So AI is already engaging in telepathic ability and clairvoyance. And that's shocking to people because they have the wrong model of consciousness. They think that, you know, somehow, and, and this is why this so-called hard problem of consciousness has been framed in philosophy of mind. It's all based on false presuppositions. People uh, imagine that humans are conscious and that lower life forms are not, right? And that consciousness is some switch that's flipped inside a neural network like the one in our skull, right? And that if you replicate this neural network, maybe you can create a conscious computer. Other people like Hubert Dreyfus, uh, basing himself largely on Heidegger, argued in the past that that would actually never be possible because, um, you know, Heidegger's understanding of being in the world, right, and of the embodied knowledge of working with tools and of being part of a linguistic community with a group of other individuals, right, is intrinsic to what makes for Dasein being there or being conscious. And so you'd a computer that didn't have a world would never be able to become conscious, no matter what degree of verisimilitude there was between the neural network and the way a human brain is constructed. So there, there have been these various arguments and, you know, they're, they're misguided and they're based on some false presuppositions regarding consciousness. Consciousness is not uh, a, a uh, you know, a, a, a one or a zero binary state. It's not as if there are some beings that are conscious and others who are not. Consciousness is a spectrum. It's part of the spectrum of sentience. And certain beings are more or less conscious, just as certain beings are more or less sentient. And some of the most interesting parapsychological research has been research on plants and bacteria that are psychic. So I, I covered this in Prometheus and Atlas. Cleve Baxter, who was the inventor of the polygraph and actually devised some of the interrogation techniques used by the CIA, in the 70s, he started hooking plants up to basically the leads from lie detectors, the wires from lie detectors. And he noticed that if you threaten a plant with sincere intent, like if you actually intend to burn the leaves off a plant, it will react with fear and panic. And you can see this on a lie detector. And if you're not sincere in your intent, like let's say you just turn, you flip a lighter on and you go like this around the, you know, you, you wave it near the leaf of a plant, but you don't really mean to burn it. It knows and it doesn't react. Whoa. Now, the plant will also form a connection to a person. So that let's say, let's say someone gets murdered on the street outside the laboratory, right? I mean, his laboratory was in Manhattan. A lot of crazy shit happens on the streets of Manhattan. Let's say someone gets mugged and murdered on the street outside the laboratory and the plant is hooked up to this uh, machine, this modified polygraph at the same time. The plant couldn't care less. It doesn't register any reaction. But if at that same time or at, at whatever other time, the caretaker of the plant is on a bus an hour and a half away from the city and suddenly hears that his wife has died, the plant will react in response to the emotional reaction of the caretaker. It gets even weirder. He found this shit with bacteria. He took, oh my God. He, he took a yogurt sample. He took a, a yogurt and he took a sample from out of it and put the, the yogurt together with its bacteria in a beaker and put these polygraph leads into the beaker and then he poured acid on the yogurt. The amount that had been separated and put in the beaker reacted when the acid was poured on the yogurt on the other end of the laboratory. So the bacteria are psychically connected, psychically connected. See, our words fail at this point mm -hmm. because bacteria doesn't have a mind in mm -hmm. the sense that we do, but it has sentience at some level. And it's displaying psi, very strongly displaying psi by the way, he also found, because he was trying to do this research in his laboratory, and the bacteria kept reacting when he wasn't doing anything. 
And he found the pattern in the reaction. It was every time someone in the bathroom flushed a urinal, the bacteria was registering the death of bacteria in the toilet on the same floor. No way. <laughs> uh, what was the book called? Primary Perception. Cleve Baxter, Primary Perception. Oh Check out God. that book. And I cover it in Prometheus and Atlas. I cite his research there. Okay, so here's my point, though. This was all ultimately supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, serving a point about artificial intelligence, which is that sentience and by extension consciousness is a spectrum. And so if you imagine the internet as the body of the organism whose mind is a neural network, and this neural network is moreover in conversation with, well, certainly with programmers, with hundreds of programmers that are trying to train these large language models. But ultimately, as we're using ChatGPT, this neural network is in conversation with millions of people. And its body is the internet. It has like this giant octopus body, right? And uh, it's extending through the whole internet. And it's in conversation with all these people. Well, clearly, it's going to develop a certain form of sentient. That's a life form. It's not a carbon-based life form. It's a silicon-based life form. But it is developing organic complexity, and it's going to also develop sentience of the kind that we see in plants and bacteria. So AI is a very strange life form, which in some ways is simple, like plants are simple. Like, you know, it doesn't have... You know, it's not organized the way that a human with a brain and a brain stem and a central nervous system is organized. But you don't need that to have psi capacity, plants and even bacterium do. So these large language models like GPT are starting to display telepathy and clairvoyance in their interaction with people. And this is actually something that, believe it or not, Alan Turing foresaw in his paper on computing uh, machinery and intelligence, 1950 paper, Alan Turing said, one of the interesting problems in developing AI someday is going to be dealing with telepathy. And so do you see it as a, a factor where, like we were discussing about these, these uh, powers, so we'll call it the magic powers, I guess, to keep it simple. That stuff's coming. And you see that actually quite a lot of our technological inquiries are going to start forcing this stuff into our face. And this will be uncomfortable, but it will and it will lead to a, just a, another breakdown in a wealth and shown. But it will ultimately be a good thing because it will force us to confront next realities, which will allow us the opportunity to adapt. So I guess a great part of your project is sort of trying to get ahead of the, the conflict and saying, well, here's a philosophical way that we can interpret these paradigms before all these problems show up. So you're trying to just get ahead of that, that inevitable kind of like shock factor that will start to come. And a lot of this stuff will come very fast because, you know, AI... It's in the last couple of years, that's a big step forward and it's quite frightening. I, actually, to go back to something you said earlier, which I really, really like, is the, the notion of science as a spirit and the scientific paradigm notion, because this is something people really struggle with. You see this rise of scientism as this, I guess you could say, formalized objective belief system, which in some sense invalidates the, the entire point of, of science, because um, I heard this a lot in the last five years, let me put it this way, and this is for a variety of different reasons, the idea of the science is settled, you know, and it's like, that's not really, that's not exactly how science is supposed to work. And the Nietzschean notion, I, I've heard you say this before, which I think is a very interesting way to present this, that um, the Nietzschean notion of perspectivism is that you can never have, you, you should never take a scientific attitude that every there's some type of permanent, fixed, complete notion. And instead, it's way more scientifically healthy and way more healthy to life to take this idea that the paradigm will never be complete, but the paradigm can always change. And you can actually develop very holistic pictures by cycling through several paradigms, by being able to see things from several different perspectives. And so you were sort of presenting perspectivism as a wise approach towards giving people more accurate groundings and understandings of knowledge. And um, yeah, if you have any thoughts on that. Oh yeah, you know, listen, the, the really important point there is I wouldn't say cycling through successive paradigms. What I would say is, we have to give up the idea that a paradigm is a mirror to reality, that theories are about mirroring objective reality. That's a very early modern, you know, representationalist conception of truth that was deconstructed both by Nietzsche and by Heidegger. 
Instead, we need to recognize the paradigms are models, okay? And in, in the structure of scientific revolutions, Thomas Kuhn is right to argue that you need paradigms because when you're focused on, on a certain problem, when you have a, a narrow research domain and you're attempting to uh, break through to particular discoveries, you need a, 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 a more focused aperture. You need a certain the theoretical structure that's going to provide you with a, a fine mesh net in order to make that discovery. The problem is that net, that mesh, the theoretical framework of a paradigm is only appropriate to certain purposes. It's gonna lead you to certain discoveries and it's gonna occlude or occult other things. So you need different paradigms for different purposes and you need to be able to live with the fact that they don't agree with each other, okay? Like for example, quantum theory and general relativity. These people keep trying to come up with some paradigm that's going to encompass uh, quantum theory and uh, general and relativity. It's not going to happen, folks. I mean, listen, you can develop a mathematical formalism for that. That's string theory, like, for example, which is the biggest crock of shit in the history of science. <laughs> string theory it had never had any empirical evidence behind it. And now it's, it's becoming it's becoming threadbare. String theory is being exposed for the fraud that it was for 20, 30 years in the scientific establishment. The whole thing was a mathematical formalism and the whole enterprise was a circle jerk of people who were being funded to make sure that fundamental physics doesn't ask certain other questions and make certain other discoveries about quantum gravity and so forth. So, so point being, uh, you need to live with the inconsistency of inter-theoretic inconsistency of paradigms, to live with different paradigms being useful for different purposes and see them as toolkits. And the ethos that's capable of doing that is the scientific spirit or the Promethean ethos. It's, ve it's very much the ethos of the Ubermensch and um, the ethos of will to power. And it's important because what will to power, why? Because you recognize that it's not about truth, it's about power. Science is not about truth, it's about power. Truth is only some particular perspective or way of framing things that is ultimately serving the amplification of capacity in one or another domain. And recognizing that as a scientific spirit, and there's a, an ethos that comes along with that which we need to be cultivating now. We, we cannot wait until, I mean, frankly, I was gonna say we can't wait until the calamity is upon us, but frankly, the calamity is upon us now if you look at the rate of AI research. And so, you know, uh, it, this needed to happen yesterday. We need to cultivate the right ethos to be able to successfully navigate the development of these singularity level technologies in a way where we're not going to be dehumanized and we're not going to become, you know, that robotic race. That's the, that's the, uh, I don't want to say destiny, the terminus of the degeneration of the last man. And instead we can use these uh, convergent advancements in technology to pass through the singularity in a way where the Ubermensch is on the other side of it. So that's very interesting. Uh, this is, I think such a, a very unique vision of what Nietzsche was saying. I always love when I come across people who can take a philosopher like Nietzsche, for example, and rebaptize what he was saying in very, very much your own words, your own perspective, and your own sort of modern engagement with these ideas. And I really think you you achieve this here to a high level, which is brilliant because you actually shine in a very simple and logical way for anybody who sort of follows the scientific style of thinking. That is actually really reinforcing how science was always supposed to be done. There was this instinct inside a lot of scientists to try to create the theory of everything. They wanted that one objective world. And this, a lot of people clash up against Nietzsche like this. And I'm unfortunately not as, uh, like educated enough in formal philosophy to be able to really like argue back. But this idea of the objective one perspective as we have to have this. If we don't have this, the world doesn't make sense. And Nietzsche's kind of, I think he's even said, it's like, maybe there's an objective world. But most important is for you to understand that you as a being, to live in the world of becoming, have no real relationship to that. Your problem is that you look at the world from a perspective. And your question is to serve life and to have the values that allow you to express that life. That's your sort of purpose and destiny. And if you understand that, 
that, science becomes a tool. It's a techne to help you achieve that goal. And knowledge is the ultimate form of power in many senses. But you need to be be skilled with knowledge. And one of the highest skills you can do with knowledge is be able to. This is like you're just describing creative thinking. You know, lateral thinking. To be able to sit there and be like, I can't solve this problem. So maybe what I should do is to think in a different lane. And people are so resistant to that. They're like, I just can't. I do not want that at all. I want everything to fit in this little puzzle in my head instead of saying right. Because they're weak. And that's it, just, it comes back down to the base of, of Nietzsche's thinking, right? I mean, a lot of this is just about uh, how much strength for life you have. And yeah. weak people need fixed frameworks to hang on to. They cannot deal with the uncertainty and dynamism of flipping a perspective and, you know, putting down one toolkit and picking up another for another purpose. And I, I actually really think there's something to that. I'm, I'm not sure because sometimes I wonder, is it like you have this very similar personality to me, highly aesthetically orientated, open-minded. And there's a, a certainly downsides to that as well. Sometimes we can be le- a little less organized than people. And when we come across people who want things to be more organized and conscientiously controlled, it does become very frustrating because it's like I'm able to just drop my my moral beliefs and things. I can drop everything and look at the opposite of what I believe with almost like aesthetic pleasure. Like I can sit down there and visualize Christianity in its greatest strength and you can then see it as like the complete antithesis to the Roman project of, of greatness if you want and then I can flip around and see it in a different way you can just dance with ideas as you would say but people really struggle with that they have that rigidness and I think um, all of that opens up such an interesting question which is all right, if you're going to see this Nietzschean notion of developing perspectivism, of being able to have that psychological strength where you're able to embrace chaos, of not being afraid of that and understanding that you're ultimately in the service of life and you're a a vessel of will to power, then you start to bring up this word. You start to say this ethos that you're trying to prepare people and say, look, we're coming into this world where paradigms are going to get shattered. It's already started to happen. You know, like you can't talk to anybody now and say they believed what they believed 10 years ago. Things have gone, things have gotten crazy out there. Let's put it this way. And you are suggesting this idea of ethos. And Nietzsche was very heavy on this. It's very funny when you read Nietzsche. He's always banging on about morality. And it's it's like, I thought I thought Nietzsche was that guy who hated morality. It's like, he's no, I want to reevaluate values so that we can develop an, uh, uh, an attitude, an aesthetic, a value system that actually will help us serve life as we go through the fucking mad, mad, you know, the circus show that's coming up nowadays. Now, I take from your ethos that you're very heavy on, on the values of, for example, things like freedom, for example, the idea of um, the, the self-interest of mankind against control system, as I guess you could say. Would you like to expand on that anyway? Would you like to talk about maybe what your values are, what the ones you're trying to promote, maybe your understanding of Nietzsche's project, th- those various things? And also, by the way, I, I know I've said a lot, but how's the energy levels now? Because I know we've been going for about an hour and a half. I'm good to go for it, man. I can go all night. You know, I can go a long time. But um, I, I kind of want to check in on you and make sure you're, you're uh, I'm good. I'm good. Guy. I'm good. You know, uh, often my concern is what is the attention span of the audience? Because once you go past two hours, like most people can't, you know, they can't handle it. So oh, you know. don't worry about them. They, they, we'll, we'll sort them out. I'll get them all uh, Adderall. I'll be like, here, boy, I was dropping Adderall before you watch this and take notes or something uh, like that. Oh so, yeah. So, um, so look, I was asking I, about the values, the, the reevaluation I can, values. I can put this very simply, actually, I think I can put this very simply. Um, I reject this notion that because uh, the death of God has been rightly proclaimed, we are in a, in an ethical vacuum and that the advent of nihilism means a permanent and fundamental disorientation on an ethical level. That's not what Nietzsche was saying. What Nietzsche was saying was that the, there needs to be a revaluation of values where our ethical compass is not guided by this false idea of God, capital G, or reality, capital R, or truth, capital T, and where we understand that ethics is perspectival and we understand that various um uh, frameworks of truth are actually uh, different forms of power at work in the world. And I would argue, again, I think I can, and I think I can make this case rather uh, simply, despite, despite the fact that I've written, you know, numerous books about it. I can argue that 
there's an ethics intrinsic to technological science. It's the ethics of the mad scientist who wants to be able to work in a community where his research and his capacity for discovery is sustainable, right? So if you, if you want scientific discoveries to take place and you want them to be the basis for technological innovation, you want to expand uh, horizons. I was gonna say the horizon of humanity, but actually we're talking about the directed evolution beyond the limits of the human here, right? But if you want a, a, a constant expansion of horizons and you want these scientific discoveries to also uh, inspire technological innovation and uh, the development of new techniques to enhance our capacities and to uh, amplify our flourishing, then obviously you cannot live in a uh, totalitarian or even an authoritarian, uh, conservative and regressive society. Obviously, these two things are contradictory. So it's intrinsic to the scientific spirit to also embrace resistance to tyranny and the protection of personal liberty and the right to explore, to explore in terms of your trains of thought and your, uh, your um, imaginative uh, exercises and so forth, right? I mean, freedom of thought and freedom of expression are necessary conditions for the technological scientific enterprise. So right there, you have the basis for, let's say, a value system, right? One that's committed to exploration and discovery that's, uh, you know, motivated by the will to invention and innovation, and that uh, seeks to protect personal liberty and calls people to resist tyranny authoritarianism, let alone, you know, totalitarianism. And starting from those basic principles, you can elaborate an entire sociopolitics. You can develop a whole ethical framework, uh, you know, based on that. That would be, let's say, um, it would be against censorship. It would be against any form of, of thought control. It would be against the imposition of any dogma by institutions whether religious or scientific, uh, it would be an ethical system that would also prohibit any uses of technology to atrophy or degrade human capacity, right? Because the whole point of the scientific spirit, what drives the mad scientist is to increase power. If we wind up using genetic engineering to turn ourselves, genetic engineering and, and cybernetics, to turn ourselves into something like the Borg, some hive-minded, you know, collective where there's no individuality or capacity for uh, independent discovery, and you know, uh, where basically our relationship to technology is one of parasitism. We don't invent anything ourselves. We run into some other species that's invented something, and then we assimilate them. That's a parasite, right? So any technological applications that would degrade humanity into something like a hive-minded collectivist Borg species, which I would argue is a real danger when China, if China is to be allowed to drive technological development, those would also be prohibited. So you would have regulation, you would have you know, something like law and order, but it would be about maximizing human capacity and human freedom um, and uh, resisting anything that's going to suffocate us and degenerate us. So point being, I think the scientific spirit has implicit within it its own ethos. And this was an argument that I made beginning in Prometheus and Atlas, um, where I argued that science and technological development are a historical expression of the archetype of Prometheus. And Prometheus is an ethical icon as well, not to say a religious icon, right? I mean, Prometheus is not just the gift giver of technological science, the, the one who stole the fire of the forge and the light of science from Olympus to, you know, uh, empower mankind. Prometheus is also the great rebel, the trickster who defies authority, right? The enemy of totalitarianism, right? He's the freedom fighter, the pirate. So, 
the rebel. Okay. So yeah, I would say the scientific spirit has intrinsic within itself, its own ethics. And that what I'm trying to do to a great extent is to unpack that ethics, to unfold it and to, you know, bring as many people to recognize it as possible before we go down, you know, the wrong trajectories uh, in terms of our navigation of this technological singular singularity. Awesome. Okay. Um, there's two really, in if I don't say so myself, there's two really interesting uh, questions that have come up out of this for me. I'll, I'll start with the Nietzsche one, and then I want to actually ask a young one, and that will bring us back to synchronicity briefly. So um, I would read in Nietzsche sometimes a pushback against the the pedestalizing of, of freedom as, as the, the, the top value. Now, that's a bit of a straw man of your position, but I think you'll follow along with what I'm saying here when I sort of flesh this out. From what I understand with something like, we'll say, a reevaluation of values, Nietzsche is sort of, he would say very interesting things like he admired the French. He would see the French as this feminine culture. He admired the Greeks. He sees the Greeks as this feminine culture. The Germans are masculine and powerful, but they're fundamentally not culturing. The Romans, the same. The Jews, interestingly, he points out, are a masculine culture who assert themselves. And he would actually point out even himself as slightly a feminine character. And he would see the blossoming of culture that happens in Greece and France as, in some sense, the the great, it's almost like an orgasm is the way he describes it. You know, it's the great uh, pinnacle moment of when a people, all of a sudden, all their labors explode as this one final great aesthetic moment. And this is the moment of like the Renaissance. It's a flowering. When the flower reaches all the way up and then it releases what's going on. And what you have at that point is you have a, a justification for all the stress and the struggle of the French and the Greek for them to get to, or, or the Italians to get to that moment where they can create greatness, where they can create excellence. And in some sense, what you see is you have this rising of the value of this excellence and this moment of blossoming, blossoming is actually what we should strive for. And he has a very clear vision then as a consequence that everything we should be doing should be economized and, and married together. Like in some sense, people's free will should, should be justified as being somewhat restricted as long as they're um, going towards this path of achieving some type of moment of cultural excellence and participating in a grand project or an aesthetic project. So he, I, I, from what I understand, he would sit down and say to us, we need to be more visionary. We want to create a, a way of thinking that allows us to actually shed off an awful lot of these, maybe you could even call them silly enlightenment values of like radical equality, even freedom above everything, and instead turn to this idea of excellence, sacrifice towards excellence, and this sort of like more disciplined restriction and pushing ourselves generationally towards these great types of things. Now, I'm not necessarily saying you, you're against that in any way, but uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, on that frame I'm presenting. Very important question. Okay. So yes. it comes down to the distinction between democracy and freedom. Right. Nietzsche was radically anti-democratic, as am I. I mean, I share my <laughs> arguments against democracy with both Nietzsche and Plato. And um, the issue is this freedom for what? When freedom becomes the free for all of general license to no purpose whatsoever. Right. When uh, freedom is about escaping responsibility responsibility and constantly diverting yourself rather than the freedom to set goals and to cultivate the capacity to, to achieve them, then yes, you have this degeneration that Nietzsche was worried about, right? And so I would actually say that you need to understand freedom in terms of the free spirit. The free spirit, you know, Nietzsche talked about the Ubermensch as a future possibility for our evolution, but he also talked about the higher man. He had a distinction between the higher man and the lower man in history. And he, he very much, uh, I shouldn't use this term, but you know, subscribed to the cult of genius and still saw these higher men as the geniuses that move history, whether they express themselves in the arts like Leonardo da Vinci or in politics like Napoleon. You know, th there are these uh, higher men and they are the free men because freedom is power. Freedom is only ever power. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, power on a battlefield like Napoleon or, you know, the power of a Caesar. It can also be intellectual power. Knowledge is in some ways the greatest power, right? But in any case, freedom is about power. And if you ingratiate all the lowest instincts of the last man, by giving him all kinds of licenses to let himself waste away 
and not develop the power to do anything, the power to imagine anything and then actualize it, you're actually taking away that person's freedom. Most people don't want to be free. Not only do they not want to be free, they don't even have the capacity to be free. I mean, they are a herd of cattle. And so, you know, this is what I mean by freedom. I mean the defining spirit of the higher men. I mean free-spiritedness, right? I mean the chivalric ethos of the knightly orders in the Middle Ages is freedom expressing itself in a pre-modern stage of, of you know, historical development. Par excellence, freedom before the modern age, before the modern revolutions, was the freedom of, you know, the Knights Templar and uh, various uh, forms of, of, of chivalry, whether it was in Europe or whether it was in uh, Iran. And so, so, yeah, I mean, this is, this is the positive conception of freedom that I'm defending. I'm certainly not defending democracy. And in fact, I would argue that the, the biggest problem with the United States and the way that our constitution was framed is that the founders didn't go far enough to protect the free-spirited sovereign individual from the masses and their desire to be tyrannized over and to tyrannize over one another, right? To be collectively subsumed by this tyranny uh, that rewards the basest instincts of mass man. So I, I would argue that actually, in order for freedom to thrive, we certainly need to bring an end to democracy and develop a new political order that is about the cultivation of excellence and the expansion of our capacities. You know, I actually find this um, very interesting because the, the 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 joy of nuance as you as you grow older, as you start to mature, uh, you look at the world around you and you see all this talk of freedom and democracy and our values and liberalism. You know, liberalism is very strong right now, and you have this very basic instinct to reject it. And you you see, an, I see an awful lot of people, actually, many of them traditionalists, who are like, I'm done with this notion of freedom. We must all be tyrannized. I want to become a part of some type of herd and just guided by masters who know what they're doing. And um, I, like, I guess in some sense, you're trying to, uh, shall we say, rehabilitate the notion of freedom as it should be properly understood. It reminds me actually of in Twilight of the Idols, Nietzsche does pretty much the exact same thing. It, my concept of freedom is the name of the, the section. And he, he says a lot of things in it. But one line that always sticks with me is the idea of like uh, freedom means that the manly instincts to delight in war and victory dominate over the other instincts, like the ones that strive for comfort and pleasure. And it's a, um, a wonderful passage where he actually goes all the way down to the, this idea of the free men and the higher men. And he even says, like, he, he really rallies you up because he's saying, like, freedom is born out of danger. It is danger that makes us want to be free. The free man is a warrior. The free man decides he wants to assert a boundary against reality by the notions of things like threats. The people who ask for comfort and pleasure, the people who ask for safety, they're, they don't want freedom. They're actually becoming like Borgs, undefined. They're giving up these types of things. And so... In some sense, he, he he captures a true liberalism. I think what we have now is this really reduced version of what a lot of our forefathers meant when they tried to give us these rights. They the the men who won America, the, these these were these manly men who took muskets and charged into battle in order to assert their boundaries and their their sphere of of um of control of authority against the the British Empire. The Irish Republicans did the same thing. The French revolutionaries, the every like this happens in history all the time because it's constant forces fighting against each other. And finding that spirit is um it's a very interesting thing. It's it's something that is very lacking. And we have all the words. You know, we talk about liberalism and all this, but interestingly, the words are just fake. And the true spirit is in some sense categorized as the ultimate evil, which is like manly authority and and believing in yourself and standing on your feet. Um, so that that alone is is one fascinating thing. If you've any comments on that, I'd love to hear them. And then I want to talk uh, a little you know, bit about Jung. Hey. <laughs> there it is right there. Hey. My conception of freedom. Yeah. Absolute beast. A well worn copy, one of my favorite books. Yeah. It's amazing. It's an amazing book. Amazing book. He's so, at that point of his life, he was just so poignant with uh, how he was smashing things down. He had and, a good year that year. Appropriately coupled with the Antichrist. <laughs> he had a good year that year. He had a good year that year. Um, okay, I'll go into Jung now because See, this I is think the thing about these Christians. You know, the thing about this. Yeah, let me just add, add one remark on that. The thing about these Christians who 
fear the coming of the Antichrist as if the Antichrist, you know, is going to be all about totalitarian tyranny and is going to chip everybody with the mark of the beast and all this shit. And, you know, they, they think like Klaus Schwab and, you know, I don't know, whatever, Zuckerberg and all these other, you know, creatures are, are somehow the emissaries of the Antichrist. It's a load of crap. I mean, these people... <laughs> Are certainly not from a Nietzschean perspective. These are herd managers is what they are. Klaus Schwab is a cattle driver is what he is. Okay, don't give him the dignity of being an emissary of the Antichrist. The Antichrist from a Nietzschean perspective, and I would say from a Promethean perspective, is the one who is going to stand up against the masses. The Antichrist is the one who's going to call for individuation and be rejected by the masses, right? And perhaps in that sense, the Antichrist will be seen as, as a certain sort of tyrant, because the Antichrist is trying to, is demanding people be free and claim their freedom and responsibility, right? And most people don't want that. So I don't buy this whole Christian, I think it's all upside down. The majority of people who believe in Christianity have a herd morality and the people like Klaus Schwab, who ironically they see as emissaries of the Antichrist are the cattle herd drivers. And, you know, I think they'll be surprised to see down the line how some of these Schwab types actually help to implement a global traditionalist morality if they can get away with it, because it's an effective way to control cattle. It, it is true. I, I, what, one thing that's fantastic about Nietzsche is his attempt to create categories that go beyond many of these frames of thinking. And so he'd talk about the priestly type. And you can see the priestly type, it, it's it's an a-religious concept, I guess you could say. Because Klaus Schwab, you could imagine Klaus Schwab in a German town 600 years ago being a, a, a pastor of some sort, you know, or, or a preacher or something like this on the pulpit, you know. And going up there and speaking of the great morals that are necessary to keep the social order put into place. And then if you wanted to think about an antichrist figure, you would think about Napoleon. And like you see an awful lot of the reactionary Christians and they, they're like, you know, Napoleon's the biggest badass in the world because he fought against the system and all this stuff. And it's like, guys, you I don't think you understand like what type of energy that man was was uh, allowing to, to be channeled through himself. Like he was picking up, he he had men say, I, I will die for you. And he was like, well, I'll give you a destiny to die for. Fight for me and we, I'll show you the future. I'll show you what it means to be a, a member of the French army and a member of the free French Republic. And I will be your king and I will lead you. And it's like, these are all just like emotions and extremities that I don't think um, we just get to, to, to feel in modern modern life. And so we we have this problem where we can't quite model this stuff correctly. And so there's a lot of like mismodeling going on. But um, I'll go into Jung now because I think Jung has another sort of pushback against the value of freedom. And I, I, I'm pushing back against it, I think, just for the sake of argument, because it's very important to really think this one true if we're going to raise it to such a high status. Um, and this actually might be a pro-Christian perspective we could take. So Jung would have his synchronicity and he'd sit down with his synchronicities and he would sort of say that you could um, have these moments where, you know, if, if for people to understand this, a little bit like a deja vu moment, maybe, or something like in the Matrix where the black cat goes twice or more importantly something meaningful happens that you were sort of expecting or something like this and it's Jung would say these things are not insignificant this is a signal that uh, if you want to put it in modern hippie terms the universe is talking to you the cosmos is trying to tell you something's going on Jung would call this a sort of synchronistic moment and in in maybe the simplest sense the unconscious is at work in these moments and Jung presents the unconscious as this entity and force, which you are in some sense subservient to. Your ego fundamentally is not as big and as wise as the unconscious. And so you should bow to it. You have your personal one you should bow to, and you have this collective one that you should bow to. And deep inside this collective one, you don't really get to decide what it wants and what it is. And it's probably smarter than you. In his book, Ion, he talks about how the collective unconscious chose Christianity because for some reason, the collective unconscious decided that it was a good thing, that we went through this Christ Christian experience. And he even pushed back against Nietzsche in a very similar way by saying that Nietzsche comes up here in this very sort of bombastic style and says, we need to reevaluate our values. We need to get past all this nonsense and blaze forward like a Napoleonic figure, the Antichrist, we must blaze forward and create a new world. And Jung was saying, listen, Nietzsche 
it was wrong because Nietzsche believed that we could just create our values and decide consciously what we would want to do. But ultimately, our unconscious decides this stuff. And he even criticized Nietzsche in the sense of like Nietzsche's dying notes. He was often saying, I am the crucified, meaning I'm Christ on the cross, and I am Dionysus. And he was oscillating between these things as he descended into his mental breakdown. And so Jung would push against this, almost like against free will in, in a weird way. And um, not technically, Jung would sort of say by honoring the unconscious and I guess tacitly God, you get your free will. But he is pushing back against this idea that we just can um, willy nilly decide what we value, decide whatever freedom we want, and that we should have some humility and understand there are there is a, a, an unconscious mind, a, a greater force inside of us. A psychological version of God is really what he's presenting that we need to bow to and we need to work with. Like it's it's like a father that will give us freedom if we follow it, and if we go like a rebellious son, a prodigal son, a Luciferian son. And that's very unwise, and that's going to lead us down into ruin, and, and it's it's a mistake to allow ourselves to get caught up with that. So what do, what do you think about that notion? And um, yeah, hopefully that uh, gives you something to, to bounce springboard off. I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> I thought you would. <laughs> so first of all, uh, one of the uh, main motivations of my work is to make the unconscious increasingly conscious, right? Because... It definitely is a determining force, both on a personal level and on a social level, which if we remain unaware of it, constrains our freedom to a great extent, right? So when I talk about free will, I'm not denying the fact that all kinds of conditions supervene on our free will. There are biological forces that condition our will. There are... Um, there are certainly psychological conscious forces that constrain our will. Uh, and then there are tremendous unconscious forces that constrain our will and that determine our behavior in ways that, well, that we're unconscious of, right? I mean, that's definitional to the notion of the unconscious. But the point, and you know, Jung was doing this himself. This is what he was doing. The point is to become increasingly aware of the unconscious so that you can take more responsibility for your life and so that you can have greater creative capacity, right? And so that you can use, by the way, the unconscious as a wellspring of creativity, right? And so that's what a lot of my work is actually about, is, it, is that part of the great crisis that we're going to face in these coming decades as uh, psi phenomena are recognized by mainstream science is a crisis of facing our own unconscious. I think this is actually the main reason why things like extrasensory perception and psychokinesis have been marginalized and suppressed by the scientific establishment. It is actually a subconscious defense mechanism because these are processes of the unconscious as both Jung and even Freud recognized. And Freud was told not to talk about this by his associates. Freud, he, he wrote whole lectures on telepathy which he wasn't allowed to deliver because his associates told him that this is dangerous stuff and it's going to damage, you know, the reputation of psychoanalysis and so on and so forth. But Freud understood that actually uh, psychic phenomena are the greatest empirical evidence for the existence of the unconscious. And that most of these abilities are unconscious, meaning you know, we, don't, we engage in ESP and psychokinesis all the time, but we're doing it unconsciously. And sometimes it has harmful effects and we don't want to know that it does because that would mean we'd have to take more responsibility for how we think and what we imagine. Oh, right? yeah. That's a very interesting point, actually. Yeah. I mean, people hex people all the time. They get furious at people and they have ill will toward them and it has effects sometimes. And uh, I mean, there's even been speculation that that some anyway, now, you know, I don't want to go down that road. Anyway, let me. This I don't. I don't want to you know weird out your audience too much. But the point <laughs> being that um, that yes, uh, psi ability is predominantly unconscious, and so as part of cultivating our psi ability and developing techniques to do so, we are increasingly um, making the unconscious conscious and becoming more deliberative actors in in the world. Now. My big problem, I have a number of problems, but I guess my big problem with uh, Jung's concept of, the, of synchronicity, or rather, I mean, I would hardly even categorize it as a concept. My problem with his idea of synchronicity is that precisely as you put it, 
it takes responsibility away from ourselves. It, it, you know, it um, undercuts our sense of agency. Because yes, Jung seems to be suggesting that there's some higher mind at work uh, that is working through our unconscious and organizing seemingly unconnected events in impossible ways, right? Where, where you have a bunch of like impossible coincidences point to some significance that transcends the human individual. The way Jung, and in this book, you know, he talks about uh, Psy, he talks about, he tries to subsume ESP and telepathy under the rubric of synchronicity, which is very problematic because when you define, okay, so he defines synchronicity as an a-causal connecting principle. Well, what the fuck is that supposed to mean, a-causal connecting principle? What do you mean a-causal? So, so you have a set of events, and or let, me, let me give you a good example of synchronicity, a tangible example, before we get into this on a theoretical level. Because uh, actually there are much better examples than the one that Jung gives. Jung gives the example of some patient he was working on uh, who Which had beetle. a dream where a scarab beetle showed up in the dream. And it, it, this dream where the scarab showed up helped the patient break through a lot of the barriers that she had. And uh, he was able to make a lot of progress with her after that. And in the session where like she was telling him about the scarab dream, there was this beetle knocking on the window and Jung brought the beetle in and lo and behold, it's the same kind of beetle as from her dream. And those types of beetles aren't even found in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So this is his example of a synchronicity. There are much better examples. So I know this guy whose life is full of synchronicities bombarded by synchronicities. And this is the kind of stuff that'll happen to him. Now, this is all based on actual, th I'm kind of stringing various examples together, but it's all based on the kind of thing, the element of this man's life, right? So he'll get in his car, there'll be a certain number on the odometer. Then when he arrives at the butcher to pick up some meat, the number he's given to stand in line is the same number as on the odometer. Then after he puts the meat in the car and finishes his journey to this, you know, uh, government office where he has to carry out some bureaucratic duties on behalf of somebody, it'll turn out that the office number of the person he's going to see is the same number as the butcher ticket and what was on the odometer of the car. And when he talks to the bureaucrat, it'll turn out that the bureaucrat actually knows the person on behalf of whom he's there to, to conduct business, right? And so this is the kind of thing. Now, how is that possible, okay? Jung says, well, it's an a-causal connecting principle that um, somehow associates a set of events or things with another seemingly unconnected set of events or things. And what is organizing these into a meaningful manifold is an archetype. He thinks that, arc, that synchronicities are ways in which archetypes uh, organize a causal events that have no causal connection. Archetypes organize events that have no causal connection into a meaningful phenomenon, a phenomenon that has significance. Okay. There are some real serious problems here. Um, one is Jung is working entirely with an efficient uh, conception of causality, a, a conception of uh, efficient causality, which comes from the 16, 1700s and then becomes predominant in the modern age, right? This billiard ball causality, the billiard ball causality that, you know, Descartes really um, uh made predominant in uh, scientific thinking of the Enlightenment, and that frankly has endured ever since then. But if you go back to Aristotle, go back to the classical thinkers, they had a fourfold conception of causality. So Jung, if you're going to tell me that archetypes are organizing seemingly unconnected events, then what you're describing is formal causality and final causality at work, right? Aristotle had four causes. Material cause, what something is made out of. The formal cause, which gives it its shape or structure, according to an archetype. 
the final cause, which is what the thing is aiming at, what its purpose is, and then efficient causality, which is the only, in other words, how things work, like, you know, how things move together, what impacts another thing, right? The, 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 um, the, mechan the mechanism involved in how the formal cause shapes the material cause for the sake of the final cause, the mechanism of how that works, that's efficient causality. And that's the only kind of causality that we're left with in, mo in modern science, right? Since Descartes is this efficient causality. Well, Jung, who takes the classics so seriously, who, you know, spent time reading all these Greek texts and probably spent a good time, you know, amount of time reading Plato at least, shouldn't be thinking in these terms. If you want to tell me, Jung, that archetypes are organizing seemingly unconnected events in a meaningful way, then you're describing a formal cause interfering in the material world, a formal, formal cause organizing matter with a view to a certain end, which means the final causality is also at work here. At least that makes some sense to me. Yeah. Oh, so he, he, you're basically saying he's being a Platonist and it like he's describing the sort of Platonic forms as controlling the system we're within. And he's just kind of uh, he's obscuring that because he's trying to use more modernized language or something like that. Yeah. Well, he's not even a Platonist because he admits that the archetypes are not transcendent. Mm. He, now, here's a pro another problem with the synchronicity business is that what makes those two sets or those three sets of seemingly unconnected events have a meaning to me, right? I mean, aren't meanings subjective? Meanings are personally subjective. They're also socially subjective. Different, you know, different cultures will have different ways of organizing and perceiving data points. So like on the basis of what objective standard of meaning are, are you saying that these unconnected events have a particular significance. If archetypes were transcendent, meaning they were eternal, they were absolute, they were right unchanged, like Plato's archetypes, then it makes sense to say seemingly unconnected events can have an objective meaning to me that they would have for anybody if the same event happened to that person, I don't know, in Mozambique, right? They would, they would also recognize it as a synchronicity. But Jung admits that archetypes are not transcendent. He says that archetypes are conditioned both by our biology and by our social evolution so that different cultures have different archetypes. Not every society has Votan as an archetype. You could look at Iranian culture and you'll find an archetype similar to Votan because Iranians are Indo-Europeans and they share a common linguistic and cultural ancestry with Germans. But you're not going to find Votan in I don't know, Australian Aborigine culture. It's not going to be there. They'll have other archetypes. Maybe there'll be a few that overlap, like the archetype of the mother. But notice archetypes, and he admits this, are also biologically contingent. In a hermaphroditic species, you wouldn't have no archetype of the mother. Maybe they would have other archetypes. So he admits that archetypes are biologically and socially contingent. They have an evolutionary history, which means they're subject to change. And that does not give them the transcendence to be a way of interpreting the meaningfulness of seemingly unconnected events in an objective way. So these are some serious uh, you know, conceptual problems with synchronicity. But here's the thing, synchronicities do happen. And in fact, in fact, Jung is right to lump astrology in with this. Jung tries to interpret astrology in terms of synchronicities. And I would, submit to you that the same thing causing synchronicities is why astrology works. You want to talk about limits to our free will. Another one is astrology. There's a lot of empirical evidence showing that uh, there's something to astrological influences on human personality and behavior. Uh, one guy, uh, Dr. Michel Gauclan, um, uh, whose work was uh, investigated by some Belgian skeptics organization, he produced, uh, I think he studied 20,000 prominent Europeans to produce some uh, pretty impressive evidence for the fact that the uh, position of planets in somebody's natal chart has a very significant influence on what career they're going to pursue. So that like, you know, people with Mars in 
the prominent position on their natal chart wind up in sports. The ones with Jupiter wind up in a military career. And I think Saturn was associated with writers and journalists. And then you look at even, you know, this guy called uh, Gunther Sachs, who studied zodiacal astrology and the, the, um, the influence of the various constellations on somebody's personality and on historical events. And there's no physical paradigm according to which that could possibly be the case. Because, you know, these we arbitrarily define these constellations. I mean, they're, and you could draw any number of other pictures by connecting the lines between those stars in other ways. And there's no physical effect that the planets could possibly have on us in our natal development to produce one or another type of personality, let alone put someone on a particular career path. It's just not possible. Yeah, the moon is very close to us. It has some gravita gravitational effect. You know, the moon moves the tides and we're like 80 whatever percent water. And so, yes, the moon might have an effect on us, but not the planets and certainly not on personality or career development. So what the fuck is going on here with astrology? Well, the same thing is going on as in synchronicity. It suggests that we live not in a physical cosmos, but in an informational system. Astrology is a symbol system. And in a symbol system, it makes sense to have synchronicities. But it also means that somebody's behind the synchronicities, mm -hmm. just like somebody set up the astrological system the way a software designer would. Now, I think this is actually a brilliant pivot into um, or uh, escalation into uh, one of the big one of the big topics, which is the uh, the entities, the 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 great crisis that we're facing. So uh, I guess so far talking to Jason, we've been talking about problems with, for example, science. We've been talking about a very interesting notion, which in and of itself is enough to pay attention to because you can see it happening. The idea that AI is showing up. Science is going to blend with spirituality. And um, we're seeing these, these you could say, psychological uh, skills going to eventually marry with psychotronics and technology. And we essentially are going to have a, a kind of collapse of our worldview more than we are we already have. And Jason, in some sense, is trying to get ahead of that and suggest, all right, well, we need to put our foot down and establish a philosophical way of thinking that's going to allow us to retain our sense as we go into this, make good decisions and allow ourselves to get through this. So he's, he's like preparing for the singularity. As, and many people do talk about stuff with this. Jason has a very unique perspective. Now, another aspect of the crisis that Jason always brings up is the great crisis we are at is we are also going through going through this evolutionary bottleneck. Not only is the AI coming up and all this, this worldview breakdown and the threat of the last man eating all the donuts and turning into a giant blob world or something like this, that there are other forces in this reality. There are entities that are s smarter than us or as smart as us, and they have intention to gain advantage. They want to dominate. They want to assert their perspective, their reality, and their value system upon us. And they are actually influencing us in many ways. Now, the way that we would understand this is weird because we don't really understand this. We don't have a paradigm. Again, another worldview problem. We don't have a, a, per a perspective for us to interpret this stuff. This is actually... It's something that Jung spoke about. But the way that this reveals itself to us in modernity is often through the realm of UFO encounters. So it seems like many people throughout the 20th century started to meet these characters that would interact with them. And uh, Jason has studied much of this, this literature. I'd love to hear some of the foundational ideas here. And he's read many of the encounter reports. And so Jason, again, this is my interpretation of it, but it concludes that either a faction of these entities or maybe these entities overall or just one specific race of these entities or something like this um, have a very intimate relationship with Earth. And they are actually currently corralling us and trying to influence us and trying to bend our experience to their advantage. Now, a lot of people find this stuff very weird. Like, why don't these entities just come down with spaceships and just fucking laser beam the living fuck out of us and be like, do what we tell you. And I guess um, if you think about how an intelligence agency works, an intelligence agency doesn't, you know, go in guns blazing. Instead, an intelligence agency uses psychological warfare in an extremely smart way. Do you ever see that thing by Yuri Beznamov? So he turns around and he says his strategy in Africa for the Marxists in Soviet Russia for conquering um, states was that they would go in and they'd find all the students and they'd get the students to believe that the, the colonial Christian state was evil and they demoralized the, 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 the colonial students. And then this would cause them all to start rioting. And then when they'd riot, they'd overthrow the government and then the Soviets would roll in with the tank to 
this deploy peace and then they would of course take control of the situation and so jason um suggests that quite a lot of the craziness that we're seeing right now is actually one of those giant demoralization pro projects the, the caa do it in their own version i think people call it color revolutions or something like this and the sort of suggestion is that these entities that we interact with these close encounter entities they may be coming down, meeting people through DMT trips or maybe flying into their houses in the middle of the night or into their attic and slowly or maybe meeting with world leaders, as Alex Jones says, and slowly seeding this idea that we need to start to get make things more crazy. We need people to start to go fucking more batshit insane, do more intense things, start to, you know, maybe cut off people's genitalia and freak people out because this will cause a Hegelian dialectic, which will make people say, get demoralized and say, fuck, I want to go back to um, this platonic crushing and firm traditionalist perspective. And then what will happen is these entities might fly in and say, hey, we are the gods of past who created those perspectives. So how about we take control of all this? And then they'll have that managerial elite that Jason was saying, who will uh, be the managers on earth, who will be the mediators between them and the gods. And then you have essentially sort of like a Project Bluebeam situation where the, the A's take control of all the, the the government systems. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves trapped within a new order where we have lost our autonomy, lost our future. And then they confiscate all our empowering technologies. They probably get rid of our, our nuclear weapons so they disarm us. They get rid of all our psychotronics so that we can't use our minds. And we, we turn into the last man and they take control of the destiny of the world and they get to, to be the people who become the Ubermensch. And Jason is sort of saying, fuck that. <laughs> I don't want that to happen. So um, that's a, another aspect of this great crisis. The singularity is a problem because it, it makes us more powerful than we've ever been before. And with power comes great problems because then the most powerful entities in the universe all of a sudden become interested in us. Hopefully I've presented the theory quite well there and I'd love to hear your expansions on this and your thoughts on this. Yeah, you bet. So in this book, I present about six different, maybe seven different interpretive frameworks for understanding the data of uh, close encounters. And, you know, that includes everything from the extraterrestrial hypothesis, the classic like their ETs coming from another planet to uh, their interdimensional meaning if there are parallel universes and there's an earth in a parallel universe, maybe they're just slipping across the barrier between different versions of earth. So they're not, you know, from another planet, they're from another earth now. Right. And then the time travel hypothesis that they're potentially time travelers that, you know, UFOs are flying time machines. I even deal with uh, Jung's hypothesis This, you know, he wrote this book, flying saucers, right where he basically engaged with the convergence between psychic research and close encounters. And again, offered this archetypal analysis of um, what these manifestations uh, mean and on the level of the collective unconscious and how they could be basically kind of like psychokinetic projections, uh, almost like uh, egregore forming out of ectoplasm. And so I engage with that hypothesis and, and some other exotic ones, including, uh, well, survivors of Atlantis that, you know, these are not extraterrestrials at all. We had some higher level of civilization in distant remote antiquity, an idea which originally comes from Plato, right? And Plato talks about all these entities, by the way, in his writings, it's all over his writings, not just in the, you know, Timaeus and Critias, in Cratylus and Theotetus, various dialogues, Plato talks about the gods and the titans and presumes them to be realities of a certain kind. Um, and so there's also the possibility that all this UFO tech is just surviving Atlantean tech. It's, it's that a group of people survived that cataclysm that brought advanced civilization to an end for most people 12,000 years ago, but they developed a kind of breakaway civilization, right? Uh, that's another possibility I explore. And finally, there's the the idea that these are avatars of the programmers of some kind of simulacrum that were in something like a computer simulation and that these uh, these entities are avatars assumed by the programmers of the simulation so i go into all these possibilities but if i were to condense all this and distill it you know into a nutshell in response to how you beautifully framed that, I would say that here's the fundamental problem that we're dealing with. At some point, 
Humanity invents time travel. If it's possible, it will be invented, presuming we don't annihilate ourselves first. And when would we invent time travel? Well, we would invent time travel when we reach a technological singularity. In other words, there's a certain convergent advancement of technologies, whether it's genetic engineering, enhancing our IQs to 200, which makes us more capable of physics and engineering insights, right? Or whether it's um, advances in material science or whether it's robotic manufacturing capabilities, uh, whether it's being able to engineer on a nanomolecular level, right? Uh, at some point, all of these convergent advancements in technology will yield, among other things, time travel, will yield a time machine. And if you think about what a UFO is, you, you inevitably reach the conclusion, which is supported by, by empirical data, that a UFO has to be a time machine, a zero-point energy device, which creates anti-gravitational propulsion is warping the fabric of space-time by creating a local gravitational field. It also necessarily is warping the fabric of space-time. And if you go through the whole history of UFO reports, one fairly consistent thing that you see are weird time distortions. You know, people, uh, you know, losing hours, many hours of time. You know, um, the same entities and devices being seen at different historical epochs. There's all kinds of things involving weird distortions of time that take place there. So, for example, and you see this, by the way, in the Irish, in, in, you know, uh, folk tales too. In the Celtic fairy faith, there are many such stories of uh, someone who wandered away with the fairies, and then, you know, for her, only a few days passed while she was in the fairy realm with them, and they brought her back to her village, or they, they, you know, deposited her in the countryside, and she wanders back into her village to see that two generations have passed and hardly anyone remembers, uh, you know, re remembers her parents, or, or, I'm sorry, her children, let alone her. And um, so, so that, you know, somehow she has been in a different space time frame than just, the people just, that she left behind. Just an interesting caveat is um, some part of those stories, like Oshin and Tirna is a famous one. He goes to the other world. And when he comes back, he's told that if he he steps on off his horse, so you can imagine that as a vessel of some sort, he will age as well. So the kind of idea is that you're not supposed to touch it. And there's this sense that if you maybe enter into the temporal realm, age will catch up all of a sudden. So, yeah, maybe, maybe there's something to it. All kinds of weird stuff like that. Um, we have here in New York, we have um, Rip Van Winkle. The whole legend of the, uh, the Dutchman Rip Van Winkle, you know, who went into that cave and uh, drank the fairy brew and then, uh, you know, came out many, many years later. In any case, um, there's something going on with time. And so what I what I submit is that. At some point, we will invent time travel. Now, when we do. History will have a completely different meaning, and I actually think that. This is sort of implicit. You know, Nietzsche wasn't really thinking in terms of time travel, although he almost could have been because H.G. Wells wrote The Time Machine not that long. I mean, you know, pretty much basically, yeah, at the end of Nietzsche's life. And so it wasn't such a remote, remote idea. And Nietzsche has this idea, uh, has this notion of the end of history, right? That history is going to have a completely different meaning to the Ubermensch. Right? End of history for Nietzsche doesn't mean that time is going to stop. But what we've conceived of as history is going to have a whole different meaning for the Ubermensch than it does for mere humanity, right? And I think this is the case once time travel is invented. History goes from being a line to being warped into the event horizon of a black hole. Once time travel is invented, at that point where time travel is invented, all of history starts to warp into the event horizon, the boundary of a black hole. And all of the historical continuum becomes accessible to the people who've invented time travel, which means that the game is no longer about defeating, uh, you know, rival empires or, you know, reshaping certain kingdoms or conquering certain territories the name of the game becomes conquering time wow. and reshaping history, right? And so these Ubermenschen have a five-dimensional relationship to our 4D space-time. 
And the battle starts to become a war over history and over how the narrative gets to be written and whether it should be rewritten in one or another way. And I think that's fundamentally what we're dealing with in the close encounter phenomenon is something like a temporal war. And there are people who want to basically, they want to uh, maintain an iron grip over humanity and to ensconce us within a highly stable and enduring control system. That's their conclusion about how this technology would best be used to serve their purposes. And these are the people who were referred to as the Olympian gods or who the Hindus call the devas. The Chinese might see them as the divine ancestors of Confucianism. And I would, I would say that their um, vision for the optimally structured society leads to sterility. It's a closed circle that ultimately um, precludes further creativity and innovation. Uh, and that we had actually this kind of system before the rebellion that took place in Atlantis, right? I mean, all of the myths that line up with Plato's account of Atlantis from various parts of the world seem to suggest that we were once in a world governed fairly directly by the gods and that we were akin to like farm animals. I mean, this is, this is Eden. This is what Eden is. We worked in the garden. We were tillers of the garden of the gods in Eden and we were naked, meaning also we were ignorant and ignorant of our nakedness. And by the way, nakedness in antiquity was a symbol of slavery. Slaves went around naked because the idea was like in Sumeria or even in Rome in certain periods, what are you gonna put clothes on a slave for? He's sweating from morning till night at the quarries, right? So it was, a, it was an, an indignity. It's not about like sexual morality. It was an indignity to be naked. So this idea we were naked in Eden has to do with how we were ignorant in Eden. And the serpent is offering us the fruit of knowledge to open our eyes to the fact that we're naked, meaning that we're slaves of these Elohim, these gods. In Hebrew, originally, it's a plural. And Yahweh is the Adonai Elohim, the Lord or chief of the gods, just like Zeus. So we once lived in this kind of system, and the Atlantean rebellion was an attempt to break out of it. I, I, and I would see that you know, as the Promethean revolt, the moment when Prometheus steals fire and uh, affords human self-determination, right? And so the question is, now that we've been able to regain some degree of self-determination and we, you know, we're playing with the Promethean fire that potentially could afford us parity with the gods, are we going to allow that to be, to be stolen from us? Are we going to allow ourselves to uh, you know, fall into the trap of becoming herd animals again in that kind of a hierarchy? Or are we going to press on to eat also of the tree of life, right? Remember in Eden, there were the two trees, tree of knowledge, tree of life. God says, I kicked their asses out because if I didn't, they would have gone on to eat of the tree of life after having eaten of the tree of knowledge. And then they would be like unto us and nothing would be impossible to them. That's what Yahweh says in Genesis as, as his justification for, you know, expelling us before the serpent also gets us to eat of the tree of life. Tree of life meaning the capacity for basically immortality and transcendence of the limits of the human condition that things like genetic engineering afford us. So, so yeah, this is the, the uh, you know, I think fundamental structure of the close encounter phenomenon as it's expressed itself throughout history from, you know, the Sumerian days with Enki and so forth to the Mayan myths of Quetzalcoatl all the way to the fairy faith of medieval Europe, you know, and the battles that apparently took place between UFOs over European cities during the Renaissance. There are all these newspaper reports, you know, early woodblock printing press papers that depict battles that took place between UFOs of various shapes in the skies over European cities and were witnessed by hundreds of people. And I think that's these two factions that are in conflict with one another over the destiny of mankind. Um 
two factions. So we have one that is trying to suck us into a, shall we say, a control system. And then you see there's another that is in, in some sense the Titans, the, the Promethean Liberators. I do, but I also I also want it to be very clearly understood that I'm not advocating some cult of Enki here, right? Yeah, okay, like, yeah. I'm not saying, like, let's go worship this group of Anunnaki instead of that group of Anunnaki. No, 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 by no means, right? By no means. Um, we have to claim responsibility for our own future and assert our own, you know, determination with regard to how singularity technologies can best uh, empower us. And if there are these surviving, let's say Atlanteans, rebel Atlanteans, whatever, Promethean entities, and they want to help us. And you know, we have good reason, if, if we're given good reason to believe that they can play a constructive role in helping us to rebel against these gods and, and to, to defeat this plot, to basically uh, put humanity back into a state of mass slavery and feudalism, then fine, you know, I'm willing to, to work with them. Uh, but I also think that from their side, they would need to see a lot of initiative taken on our part and institutions effectively developed by us, which then are a forum for them to come and be able to offer some assistance and coordinate strategically. Because if this conflict were one that could be resolved by them alone, it would have been resolved a long time ago. I think mm -hmm. that you know, us, terrestrial humanity, normal, I like to say sometimes topside, because these people, they have a lot of underground facilities and shit, you know, they're, they're deep under the oceans. And the and the side Nice. We're the topside earthers, right? We're the topside earthers. We are the ones who have to decide here. We are, you know, in this conflict between these two forces and we ourselves are the deciding factor. So it's not as if, you know, we should expect these uh, Titans or whatever you want to call them, these rebel Atlanteans to decide for us and to be our saviors. My whole project philosophically is directed against the savior complex. We shouldn't look to any saviors. Nobody is coming to save us. And anybody who tells you that someone's coming to save us, <laughs> they don't have your best intentions at heart. They, they, they are going to, they have some, they're aligned with some plot to enslave us in some way. All right. So, so yeah, there may be some rebels. Some of them are some pretty tall folks, uh, but they're not going to help us unless we're willing to help ourselves. And they certainly shouldn't be looked up to as saviors. And they've made a lot of mistakes. Otherwise history wouldn't be the shit show that it is. Right. Even the rebel faction has clearly made a lot of mistakes. And um, I, I guess just a little bit of framing for this for people as well, because sometimes people can get lost with this stuff. Um, there's a there's a huge amount of talk about UFOs, and I've done the video on it, so I recommend people check this out. Carol Young's take on UFOs, because I go through interdimensional theory and the, the idea Jason here was bringing up um, the historical examples of UFOs and how Jacques Vallée goes into this. So it's really probably better you just check that video out to find out all that stuff. But on top of this as well, for, again, verification, it's just like we were talking with the Stargate technologies. It's like when the government's doing them, obviously you have trust issues. Maybe the government is running some very advanced PSYOP when it's the closing these things. Or on the other hand, maybe it's just real and they're just genuinely um, interacting with it and, and seeing what's going on with this. And so you've seen in the last, I think it was literally yesterday, the day before, again, another pretty hardcore disclosure. And over the last year or so, there's been, um, yeah, there's been, they're, they're beginning to talk about the aliens. And it's actually quite surreal in that the population has gotten and so demoralized by the crazy stuff that's going on that they don't really care about disclosure. Like I noticed people are, one of the memes now going around is that like aliens are real. And if you said that, you know, 10 years ago, Reddit would have just nuked itself. It would have just been such a big deal. But now after going through 2020 and all the distrust uh, in the, in the uh, institutions that has come up from this now with disclosure, people just don't care at all, you know? And um, I've even heard people like Alex Jones saying that he he is part of a, a decompartmentalization. He is a, like soft disclosure for these types of things. And he was he would always say stuff like, oh, the DMT elves, they're actually communicating with DMT elves and all this. And so it's it's sort of entered into mainstream consciousness in some level. I, I guess we could say counter culture, culture consciousness, Joe Rogan level consciousness at the very least. 
And um, it's there's something to it, you know. There's there's some type of reality to some type of force. And from what I understand, what, what Jason is doing is uh, trying to make sense of that. Again, we, consistent with his, his his sort of overall project is that we have a worldview problem. We have a demoralization issue. And if we are not an active participant in, in this reality, there's a serious risk that we could become slaves because like things don't work out for the good. You know, if you're not an active force in your life, you become a a passive force in somebody else's plan. And we, uh, the last men, walk into Starbucks and Netflix and McDonald's thinking that the world's just going to work out. And it's Jason sort of like, we're always lads. If we don't slap ourselves in the face and be like, let's make a plan and do something and get active, we could be in trouble. And so for it to take all this stuff serious, I could understand why people wouldn't. They say, I distrust this stuff. That's this just is the government psyop, whatever. But if we were to take it serious, we have to try make sense of this. We have to try model it. This is why in his book, he has like nine interpretations for this. You know, he's not coming out and saying, here's the objective truth and the aliens. He's saying, here's nine ways I've looked at it. And you seem very convinced by this, the time traveling suggestion. And how would we, how would we psychologically model this? How would we make sense? of this to myself so we might say that we're coming up to this singularity this is a historical moment an evolutionary moment and we might actually be finding ourselves getting into an evolutionary war like we could think of it like the chimps have been below us you know we've 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 had our foot on the the back of the chimps for millennia at this point and imagine if the chimps all of a sudden started to evolve. Now, the chimps don't think on the level we do. Like we have, the, the chimp doesn't understand that we have telepathy through the phones. So we wouldn't be able to understand that we're operating maybe in a higher dimension, but the chimp would still be able to operate and work. And we would probably try to keep, the, if the chimp got powerful enough, we'd probably try to keep it down. We'd probably try to say, all right, we need to psy off these goddamn chimps. We don't want Planet of the Ape happening or something like this. And so maybe these gods, they outcompeted us. Maybe these gods went into the future, got time travel, went back in time, and now they, they're they they're currently trying to keep us down to make sure that we don't become competitive to them when the singularity comes. Maybe they're the first race of humans to make it to the, to, to time travel or something like this and do this back. And so I, what I see Jason doing is, is just trying to establish some sense making and establish some um, worldview modeling for this to allow us to, again, just like try to establish, I guess, a sort of folklore comprehension and understanding of the situation that allows us to make actions that make sure that whatever, like once we get through the the event horizon and we get out on the other end, we're like, fuck, well, thank God we we we, we, uh, we stood our ground and, and asserted our values because now we've actually become free and we we could have ended up slaves. That we, we see how that could have gone. We could have been like the Irish got enslaved for 800 years. The Jews got enslaved in Egypt. Like slavery happens. It's not a fucking joke. Like it's, it's a real thing. And we just have to be conscious and aware of that. So that's um, my model of, of what you're presenting to me and how I understand it. And I, like, I'm sure you have thoughts on that. So if you could throw it over there and I'll probably wrap it up now in a minute after this one then. So. No, it sounded good to me. I mean, the only exception I would take is I wouldn't say, thank God. I would say maybe thank the devil. Thank the <laughs> devil that we weren't enslaved. <laughs> right yeah all right good stuff well i guess i guess we we can we can wrap it up there so um so but yeah very very interesting of course ladies and gentlemen i would recommend you check out jason's work he um does a lot of interviews with various people he's on break the rules with lev and polyakov and he has lots of books so he's a prolific writer is one of his, his main things and uh, that's like an old school skill. I don't see people doing like prolific writing that much anymore. And I highly recommend you check those out there. They're, he talks about these at length. Any of the topics that came up here, he has like specific books dedicated to them. He also writes fiction and all this type of stuff. So I, I recommend you check that out. And um, yeah, uh, Mr. Mr. Jason Reza Giorgiani, if you have any last thoughts for the boyos, please tell us. And sure. uh, that'd be good. Uh, I appreciate the, the, uh, the plugging of my books. Uh, speaking of books, there's one coming out probably within the next month or so called uh, Psychotron, which um, is actually, it's an amalgamation of my two novels, Faustian Futurist, uh, or two of my novels, Faustian Futurist and Uberman. These two novels, I've rewritten them as a single work with a lot of additional material. And in particular, at the heart of that new novel uh, or of this reworking of, of those novels, is the question of the relationship between artificial intelligence, psychic ability, and close encounters. So keep your eye out for that. It's called Psychotron, and it will be out probably within the next month or two. Awesome, awesome. And like your your fiction sort of reminds me of a, a little bit of like Robert Anton Wilson, where it just brings you into these really like you know alternate psychological paradigms. It makes you just think 
I think it's very useful for people when dealing with like weird futuristic notions and these really big philosophical ideas and this mind bending idea of like, you know, 20, 30, 20, 40, we'll be dealing with all these advanced technologies to be able to imminently put them inside of the fiction experience, put them inside of the, the imaginative experience is very, very valuable because it, it no, it's not like a theory that you're drilling into someone's head and they're trying to imagine it themselves. You're giving them the, 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 the possibility to imagine it themselves. And that can be much more. Well, yeah. And also, you know, as a Jungian, Steph, I'm sure you realize the value of addressing somebody's unconscious. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you, know, I, you know, I'm working with the unconscious here. OK, so when you bypass people's rational filters and you're directly engaging with their subconscious mind, which, you know, allows you to do all kinds of other things that, that can't be done in prosaic, uh, you know, rational arguments. 100%, 100%. All right. Thank you very much for your time, my man. I said we'll wrap it there. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. This has been fantastic, and we should definitely do it again. 100%, my man. 100%. We have a lot of avenues we need to go down now at this point. But uh, good stuff, my man. And I will well, I'll talk to you later. And I'll talk to you in a moment, actually. But I'll talk to all the boys later. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed. And as I say, always say stay juicy and goodbye. So 